All right, guys, welcome back. I don't hear myself anywhere else. So as long as we can both hear each other, yeah. we're fixed. <laughs> is, there, is there an echo now when I'm speaking? No, I think it's gone. So I think it was, uh, unfortunately, I just blamed Ryan and it was actually on my end. Uh, Cooper Chronicles, volume five. That was kind of our first uh, sound issue, but I'd like to think that we resolved it relatively quickly. I am going to share out this link uh, real quick so we can get everybody back in here and we'll be taking questions for Ryan and whatnot. But uh, I just want to start out by saying you guys have been following the series. We're fresh off of CooperCon. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, you, you guys know what we do here. So we started off with Drew Beeson. Uh, you know, we did some awesome Braden stuff in his book there. And then um, after that, we had Eric Eulis. He's kind of uh, the, the leader of the new Vortex movement. Then we have my man, Nikki B. You know, that's the homie. He kind of he kind of brought me into the into the vortex along with Drew. And uh, now we have my favorite Cooper researcher, Ryan Burns. You know, that's I don't know nice. if you know this. I don't know if you know this, Ryan, but like I'm from Boston. I'm from the north. And okay. uh, back in the 90s, when we grew up, we kind of have this this thing up there where, you know, Southern, the Southerners are kind of not as smart as us because, you know, we made New York and, you know, right. I'm not saying I think I believe that, but it's just a thing. Now, that's not to say some of the dumbest people I've ever met aren't <laughs> from the Northeast because they totally are. But when Ryan Burns talks, man, I just feel unintelligent because this guy's case knowledge is next wow. level. The stuff that you guys have, have found out in the recent uh, Milton Verdal panel, the Rem Crew Titanium panel, fresh off, off of CooperCon, shot by Planet X Films, might I add, uh, is over on Nikki B's channel, Finding D.B. Cooper. So we'll link that up there. That is the new research team consisting of Nikki Broughton, Ryan Burns, and Chris Brower. And uh, yeah, man, you guys had some astounding stuff. I was ridiculously impressed by that panel. But uh, let them know where to find you. Oh, the website is Norjack. Dot org. That's N-O-R-J-A-K dot org. And there's a lot of amazing uh, information there. So check that out. That was the code name for uh, the FBI's code name for the hijacking. That was North Northwest hijacking. So Norjack. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, what, what were your thoughts on CooperCon? Just real quick. I think that was your first one. That was my first one. Yeah. What, what was your uh, what was your impression? Well, it was cool to meet a lot of people that have uh, I mean, you know, I, I just appreciate Eric for putting me on these panels with, um, right. you know, I saw the panel list and I go, my God, I'm going to share a stage with Bruce Smith and I'm going to, it's just going to be me and Nikki B with Bill Mitchell. Like mm -hmm. I've been reading about this guy for 15 years, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, what in the hell I I'm here. So it's really neat. Um, it was pretty sweet to, to meet everybody. And, you know, I was a lurker for a long time. I, I stayed, I stayed out of the drama, um, yep. just busy building my law practice. And I got to a point where, um, you know, my business was kind of self-sufficient and I didn't have to work so hard, I guess. And sure. I was able to start working on this stuff. And I said, you know what, I'm going to just dip my toes in a little bit. Um, and I actually have Jamie Beats, uh, who is a, a guy on uh, the Facebook group, because Jamie Beats was on a, I, so I'm on a uh, football recruiting web website, right? It's rivals.com. And um, they have a message board, a national message board, and there's a Cooper thread that has been posted in for I don't know, four or five years now. That's got I don't know, eighty thousand views, something outrageous. And I kept talking, and there was another guy on there. I'm old Miss Cub because I'm an old Miss fan and a Cubs fan. And I kept talking on there, and there was one other person who who really knew what the hell he was talking about. And I'm like, damn. And his name was Vol Fan JB. He's you know, you know Tennessee Volunteers. And um, I was like, who the hell is this guy? And finally, I started private messaging him, and I was like, oh, he's Parrothead Vol at the Cooper Drop Zone Forum, and he said, hey, there's the Facebook group. And I was like, I, I didn't even know about the Facebook group, honestly. Um, so I joined and I was like, okay, I, I can handle these people. They're not such assholes um, <laughs> as the people on the drop. I mean, yeah, it's a younger generation. Basically, I think that um, it was difficult to research this case, like really difficult to research this case before the uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, mm -hmm. stuff came out. Stuff, stuff came out Because now we can read the actual FBI documents. And that makes an enormous, enormous difference because mm -hmm. before we were relying on, I mean, if you were a Cooper researcher, you were relying on, I mean, you know, whatever the FBI piecemeal dropped uh, out to you because because the, the case was still active. So they kind of released what they right. wanted to release. Right. And so you had their flavor of it. You had 
um, Helmholtz Bach talking about what a bastard Cooper was and nicotine stained teeth and fingers and swore like a sailor. And you go, oh, wow, that must be real. But then you read the, you know, the actual documents and there's literally none of that. I mean, none of that right. at all. In fact, right. it's the opposite. You know, they're, you know, they're saying he was, you know, the stewardess are saying he was a refined person. He was an executive and <laughs> never cussed and was never mean. And was, I mean, it was just, so it really dispelled a lot of things. So, oh, yeah. you know, and, and what's interesting about that is that it was, you know, that came about through the rack straw stuff, which was, is, is the most, you know, it, it's horrible. I mean, look, you've got three big Cooper documentaries that came out the past, I don't know, five years. Um, yep. There is the, 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 the uh, History Channel one, D.B. Cooper Case Closed. There is the HBO one, uh, which is the best one. And then there's this one, the Netflix one that came out recently. But again, the HBO, I mean, the Netflix one and the History Channel one are maybe 75 to 80 percent rack straw. And it's like, mm -hmm. God almighty, and he is not he's, he's not Cooper. He just isn't. Right, right. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, as far as the FOIA thing, you know, shout out to Tom Colbert for that. And yeah. that's that's about the only thing I credit him with, with bringing <laughs> to the case, because the rack straw stuff is just like I, I, I actually really enjoyed the Netflix documentary. And it's sure. not because the, of the rack straw focus. It's because of the fact that Colbert was like rack straw, like burning down with the <laughs> ship, like while wow, his team was like leaving him. And then all the Vortex guys were like. No, no, we don't no. think so. <laughs> it, it was it was stylized well too. I appreciated. Yeah, oh, the editing was great. Yeah, the editing was great, but it's just Film like well, yeah. I, I don't want to hear but about the content. Yeah, and you know he's he's just. I mean, it's almost like I don't know if he believes it at this point. I mean, you know, there's a fallacy called the the sunken cost fallacy, where you know if you've put so much into something, you cannot let it go. And I, I, he is yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, yeah, no, there's uh, definitely check those those, those uh, documentaries out if you guys haven't got a chance. And of course, there's a bunch of good uh, Cooper books out there and whatnot. So uh, given that Ryan here is uh, is uh, in the legal profession, I know you guys covered a little bit uh, of this on the Vortex with Darren. And, uh, you know, of course, Darren is the voice of the Vortex. But uh, I just, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to get into that angle because it's not something we've covered here on my show. So you essentially said that if Cooper were to show up with some $20 bills and, and turn himself in, um, you know, it would, it would be, you know, kind of baked in there that if he were to provide the evidence on himself, it would, it would kind of be over. Well, I just wanted to see if you could take both sides of that and say, is there anything you could do for Cooper? If you were defending him, could you argue he's a senile old man? Could he plead insanity? You know, what, what would your tactic be? It would have to be that, um, that he is, I mean, it would. I would have to concoct some. You know, I would have to be an ultimate grifter and, and and make stretches of like bullshit. I would have to like invent scenarios where, oh, well, he knew he knew the real Cooper, and he's just he's just crazy and senile. And he, but he but he got this twenty dollar bill from, you know, some guy he met playing pool fifty years ago, and he's <laughs> and, and you know, and this is you know you know what I'm saying like it, it would have to the only way you could defend that. I mean, there are false confessions. That is a real thing, especially like right. if you check out the West Memphis three stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th that entailed a false confession um, from a, someone who was essentially, you know, mentally, you know, retarded, I guess, with mm -hmm. or disabled. Yeah, um, he's got a low IQ or yeah, whatever. Yeah, Jesse Miskelly was his name. And, you know, he, yeah. he confessed to this thing. And, you know, as soon as he confessed to it, he's saying, C can I go home to watch the Royal Rumble? And they're like, what? No, you, know, you just confessed <laughs> to a mur triple murder of children. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a weird case that one. <laughs> yeah, and so and so that's what you would have to. I mean, it, it would have to be false right. confession doctrine. And but on the flip side, though, would you even prosecute him? Is I, I don't know. I mean, I, I forgot to ask Bill, and I, I I feel bad. I forgot to ask him. I could email him, I guess. But you know, I, I was going to ask him at CooperCon. You're just saying you, you get and I spent a lot of time around Bill. I mean. Uh, Dave Feudman and Dave Feudman and Mark Breda and I had breakfast with Bill Mitchell three days in a row, which was mm -hmm. cool because, you know, we were on like East and Central time out there. So we were early risers and Bill's 72. So he gets up early anyway. So we were always the first one in there when the breakfast started at seven. And so all three days we had this great camaraderie for an hour just chatting with Bill. And I forgot to ask him. I was going to ask him, would you want Cooper prosecuted today? Um just, you know, and yeah, to get his opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I can't speak for him. I don't know. I mean, maybe so much time has passed um, that, 
you know, I, I look at, I don't know, I, I guess I look at like, uh, you know, we have recently had Martin McNally join our Facebook group, which is. I got to get him on. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, look, you are talking to somebody. I mean, I've talked to Martin every day now for like two weeks on the phone. He just calls me up. He goes, hey, Ryan. I mean, he's like, and it's, it's, it's almost eerie when you talk to him because he was actually pretty hardly investigated as Cooper at the time because mm -hmm. the Bing sketch was the sketch that everybody had. And so the FBI at the time was going off the Bing sketch and they didn't really know that, hey, this guy really was like in his 40s or 50s, right? And so you've got some similar, I mean, McNally's got dark hair, thin black hair. He's mm -hmm. kind of long faced. Um, mm -hmm. And McNally had, when he was in the Navy, he was in Navy aviation and his, uh, he was on a sub, his, basically his occupation was uh, that we had aircraft that would patrol the West coast looking for Soviet submarines. Okay. So McNally flew up and down. He, he had 1500, 1500 flight hours in between Oregon and Alaska flying up and down, just looking at mm -hmm. the coastline. Mm -hmm. um, so he knew that area really well. And at the time he had a brother in Seattle. So they were like, Hey, you know, and he, and, and, and he had a, uh, he had a, I mean, he had a machine gun with him. He had, he had a submachine gun with him, but he also had a, a, a bomb Ooh. in his briefcase. He had an attache case, but it is really interesting talking to him because he talks about how he'll tell you how he threw, um, you know, he did not go to, he did not go to a thrift store to, to find his clothes, but he did dress like a businessman. Cause he said, I want to, I wanted to fit in and be as nondescript as possible. So he wore a business suit with a tie. And when the stewardesses were, and when he sent the stewardesses forward, he took those off. He had blue jeans and a polo shirt underneath that. And he threw those clothes out the back and he just threw them out the back. And so, so he, cause he said, when I land, I don't want to look like what I am being described as. Of course. He is wearing a suit. And so he's very much of the opinion that Cooper you know, at, at the very least changed clothes when he got to the ground. Right. Um, but now I told him, I said, well, you know, I said, Marty, I said, so we've long thought that maybe he wore a suit to blend in, but also that maybe it would be easier to hitchhike, um, you know, to say, Hey, uh, you know, if you're wearing a bit, if you're wearing a tie or not a tie, but I guess he lost his tie, but if you're wearing a business suit or whatever, flag yeah. somebody down, Hey, my car broke down a mile away. Can you take me to the nearest phone? And then he could call his accomplice to come. You know, hey, I'm because Cooper had no idea right. where he was going to land. Land, and right. and McNally had no idea. McNally said McNally's plan was to get to a to a phone, and mm -hmm. call his accomplice to come get him, because mm -hmm. he didn't know where where when he was going to land. Right. And so right. that's kind of how I think Cooper may have done it too, if he had had an accomplice. Sure. Um, sure. So that was his thing. Is that? Um, but 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 I told him I said maybe it would be easier to hitchhike. Marty said, you know what? Everyone picked up hitchhikers back then, so I don't think wearing a suit would have mattered. Um, he right. could have been wearing blue jeans and a polo shirt, you know. I mean, hell, McNally got a ride from the local sheriff, who was part of the <laughs> part of the manhunt. Well, wow. you know they're not. The, no, the, the, I did. I did to deep dive his his case because I don't the, know it as well as the rest the, of you guys. That's hilarious. Car, the first car that pulled up was the the sheriff of the county, Ridiculous. and they were looking for the hijacker. They said, "Oh, he jumped out, you know, somewhere somewhere around here." And McNally was all beat up in the face because his parachute had popped him in the face. And he had run into a tree on the way down. He had like Dude. he had a black eye. He has bleeding, you know. And he told the sheriff, he said, "Oh, uh, I was in a fight with my friend Joe Johnson down the road." And uh, the sheriff didn't know who Joe Johnson was because it was a made-up name, right? Mm -hmm. But the sheriff did a tactic um, by saying, "Oh, Joe Johnson, he's got three sons, right?" And the sheriff was doing this as a trick question because you know if you agreed with him, he would know something was up, right? right? Um, but McNally had had this Navy uh, escape. Uh, escape and evasion training. Mm -hmm. He knew that this was the thing. So McNally said, oh, to no, no. Any he goes, yeah. well, you need well, to say, no, no, Joe's got a daughter. Yeah. And the sheriff was like, okay, maybe this guy's legit. And the sheriff goes, do you want, the sheriff goes, it's a bad time to be on the road during a manhunt. Do you want to ride into town? And McNally goes, yeah. And so McNally <laughs> rides into town. With the sheriff this is amazing. And then walks into a hotel, okay, and to wait out, you know, to, because his buddy had to come get him. Goes to right. a hotel, ends up staying there for three days with over a hundred FBI agents. Okay, at the same hotel as the FBI. Wow. Was for. Holy he, crap! He had breakfast in the lobby with the FBI agents around him, but because he wore a disguise, they weren't looking for a guy that looked at him. They were looking for a guy with big curly hair. And but speaking to him is really eerie. Um, and you should yeah. do a deep dive into him. There's a great podcast oh, called, called American Skyjacker. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, it, it's a comedy of errors. I mean, like. I mean, I, I know we have other questions to get to you, but I just have to tell you real quick. Sure. 
you of might course. not be aware of this, but during his hijacking, he followed the Cooper script. You know, we're going to land on the ground. Uh, I'm going to demand parachutes and money. And when the money comes aboard, I'm going to let the passengers off. Same, same thing as Cooper. Well, at, and he told the pilots, he said, hey, fly to, fly to, fly, fly to Toronto. Because McNally hijacked his plane in St. Louis, and he was from Detroit. So he wanted to jump out somewhere, not quite to the Great Lakes, obviously, but somewhere around that area. So sure. he says, fly to, fly to Toronto. Okay. And as they're taking off, um, a local drunk was at a bar down the road and had been watching live coverage on TV of this because it was live coverage. This drunk mm -hmm. goes, by God, by God, I've had enough of this shit. Jumps in his car, crashes through several gates in a Cadillac onto the runway and rams McNally 727 at 80 miles an hour. As Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so the, the pilots were like, oh, my God, there's a this guy's going to hit us. And McNally starts screaming and cussing. He had been like Cooper the whole time. Kept his cool, yeah. smoked cigarettes. He screams up. He screams out, get this fucking plane on the air. You know, he's like, what Lost the fuck it. is going on? Because he thought it was some kind of FBI trick, right? He starts screaming. He starts screaming, I'm going to kill every fucker in here. Oh and like, they're like, oh, no, it wasn't us. And, uh, the... and when they explained to him what had happened, he goes, that guy's crazier. He goes, his quote was, it's in all the papers. He goes, that guy's crazier than I am. You know? <laughs> yeah. So McNally got a whole wow. other 727. Yeah, yeah. He said, he said, okay, give, give me another, give me another plane. So it was just this crazy wow. thing that happened. His hijack. Listen, Jeez. If, if he had got away with it, and he did, um, but he told somebody about it, and they turned him into yep. the FBI. He literally yep. got back home and slept in his own bed two days later, right? Yeah. Now he yeah. got away with it, but he told somebody because he, because you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, he just had to tell somebody loudmouth, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but if McNally had never been caught. This our group would be the his his alias was uh, Robert Wilson I think mm -hmm. we would be the Robert Wilson mystery group because his hijacking is way more colorful way crazier obviously you know. <laughs> so, wow anyway that's amazing I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna deep dive that podcast I'm definitely looking to uh, to get him you reached out on on Facebook so so that being said um, as going back to the prosecution of, of Cooper um, you know when Tom K reached out to the FBI they told him that it was getting to the point where they're probably not going to prosecute this 80, 90 year old man, waste the resources, drag out the, the court case and, and whatnot to, to, to for, for not much. So, I mean, like what, I think it's highly unlikely they would do it now just because so much time has passed, but like, as far as getting it done, it would kind of, it would kind of require the evidence. Like it would kind of require like the money or, you know, it, it, it'd be kind of hard to even, even type or other than what you guys have found with the, uh, you know, the particles. And I, I don't, it doesn't seem like the FBI really deep dive that much, except mm -hmm. for Larry giving Tom the access to scan it with the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, high resolution microscope. Um, so, like, where, where, where do you think that sits? Do you think okay. that it would even it would even happen, or how no, would they go no? About it? And, and I, I tell you why because so much time has passed that you almost old people look. I mean, look, Cooper, God, he'd be. I mean, look, our, our suspect was the oldest is the oldest suspect ever. I mean, for sure, yeah. Milton yeah. would be a hundred and nine if he was still alive, right? But yeah. even um, you know, let's just say if Cooper was forty five at the time. He'd be 97 by now, something like that, right? So you would almost assume that this is a crazy old man, um, right. even right. if he had the money. And at right. this point, I'm not sure, like we've always said, you know, Tina didn't – look, a lot of people will cast aspersions on Tina because Tina – Tina says repeatedly in the FBI files, we know, she's like, I didn't look at the guy. She says that. You would think that woman – she but she says, I'm not – she's not much she – she gives the least help during the sketches mm -hmm. and people think mm -hmm. that's nefarious, but you got to remember a 20 year old girl, she just wanted to live. Right. And you know, she's being essentially mugged in a way um, for five hours. You know, she's being robbed for five hours. So mm -hmm. I, I picture her sitting in her chair, looking straight forward, you know, and that's what she says. She says, Cooper was on my side. He was whispering in my ear. I never got a good look at him. Mm -hmm. People say that's bullshit, but you know, look, it's almost like if you're being mugged, don't look at the bank. Don't look at the robber because you might think you're trying to size them up. Right. Look away. Right. 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 right you know, hand right, him right. your wallet as you're looking away. That's what we mm -hmm. would advise people. Actually, law enforcement does that. Don't look at yeah, the person, yeah. you know. And so she was like, I don't want to stare this guy down. Right. So personally, my belief is that Florence Schaffner got the best look at him because, you know, she looked in his eyes as she as she said, what do you want to drink, sir? 
Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he gave her the money. And when he gave her the money, she said, hey, this is a $20 bill, oddly enough. Um, she mm-hmm. says, I have to make change for this. He goes, that's fine. Go ahead. And then she comes back and gives him his change. And then she get, and then he goes, hey, by the way, here's a note. And she's looking at him with note, with, 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 look, looking in his eyes. Mm-hmm. Looking at, he says, here's a note, miss. Mm-hmm. And then she sits down right behind him in the jump seat. He turns around, stares at her, says, miss, read that note. And she goes, okay. And then she sits next to him, glasses still off. And she shows him a bomb and she looks right at him. She even says it in three or two. She says, I'm looking at him. I say, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. And so all this is before the glasses go on. Mm-hmm. And a lot of her interaction was before she was scared of him and avoiding eye contact, avoiding right. any reason not to look at this guy in the face, right? Just a customer. Right, right. Because so, nothing happened yet. Yeah. Time, and so, so her view of him is probably the best. Um, Bill's view is a side profile view mostly. I, I don't I don't know if Bill ever would have seen him head on. Um, because Pete, look, I mean, you do see repeatedly that Cooper was slouched in a seat. So he is mm-hmm. slouched over a little bit. You right. know, he might be doing this or something, you know. Um, Alice Hancock would have probably got a good view of him a little bit because so Alice, it's interesting to note that, and I, and I do believe this. So the book, uh, Richard Tosaw, uh, Rob, yeah, Richard Tosaw is a book. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that Richard Tosaw, I think, I mean, t- t- yeah, Richard Tosaw. Anyway, Tosaw's book, he actually interviewed uh, Tina Mucklow. He's one of the only people who's ever interviewed Tina Mucklow, mm-hmm. ever, and uh, for a book. And um, she must have been in a really generous mood or something. Well, he worked for the FBI at the time, a few years earlier. Anyway, right. um, Alice, actually, people, a lot of folks don't know this. So Alice, so Flo gets the note. Cooper had handed the note to her. He wasn't picky. He just gave a note to the girl. She sat down. Flo panicked. Okay, Flo said, I'm taking the note to the cockpit. She wants the cockpit, and apparently she must have been in hysterics um, because they didn't let her leave the cockpit. Mm-hmm. That's, even in, that's even in the flight transcripts with the air traffic control. They're saying, hey, we have a stew in the cockpit with us. We're not letting her leave. Because if she had left, they'd have been all the passengers would have been alerted that something's happening, right? Right, right. So they didn't let her leave. And so Tina took over. Well, Alice was the senior flight attendant. She was 25 years old. And Alice, we found out, I actually found this out recently. I found this myself. I don't think anybody's ever known this, that she was a victim of a robbery at a bank two years earlier. She hmm. was a Interesting. bank teller in, in wow. Amarillo, Texas, and had been robbed already. So Oh, wow. you know, it's a Tuesday to her or it's a Wednesday or whatever to her. <laughs> yeah, no crap. You know? But anyway, so Alice uh, looks back there and Alice actually tried to jump on the grenade, so to speak, for Tina. She goes back there and she tells Tina, she goes, hey, Tina, there's some people in first class who are looking for a deck of playing cards. Will you find some and take them to them? Essentially saying, hey, get up and I'm going to sit down with this guy because mm-hmm. I'm the senior flight attendant. It's my job. And right. Cooper looks at her and says, go back to your st-. He goes. Forget the playing cards. Go back to your station. And she goes, okay. <laughs> and so Alice probably got some good looks at him too. Um, right. But, but yeah, so, the, but, but they would, the point is, is that because he's old and because the, the memories of the witnesses are, 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 are kind of, you know, gone at this point. Yeah. Great. I mean, they really are. I mean, th- that um, there's no way to know that this person, that the FBI would know he was genuine. Now, I, I okay, take that back. I guess they could run his DNA. Um, yeah, they think they've got through. Cooper's DNA. I mean, yeah, yeah. I've read as, I've read that there are as many as 16, 16 different donors that they've pulled from the tie. Yeah. So now, now the issue is that those are partial profiles, right? They're not full profiles, so they can't um, they can't plug it in a database like the Golden State Killer and just right. reverse engineer it that way, right? Right, right, right. Um, so, but they so, so they can check against it, but they can't like in, input it into something. Um, right. So I guess they would take his DNA. And check. I guess they could find it that way. But if there yeah. was no DNA and this guy was still saying I'm Cooper, I don't think you know. I don't think the witnesses could say it was him. Well, I mean, maybe they could look at pictures of him from when he was younger. I don't know. Yeah, good call. The, the memory is. Look, I, I tell people all the time. I prosecuted a woman who was kidnapped in her own home. This guy was in her house for hours, walking back and forth, and and when we had a lineup for her days later, she picked the wrong guy. I mean, like, yeah, what? oh yeah, and, and he wasn't, yeah. even, and the perpetrator in the house wasn't even wearing a ski mask or anything. Mm-hmm. He was a bold and brazen asshole, and she picked the wrong guy two days later. So, fifty-one years of barely seeing somebody. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, and, and that is yeah. some issue with some people have with the sketches is that how could right. they remember these details? Um, but 
then again, I say Florence Schaffner was really affected by being by some man looking her in the eyes and saying, you're, you're, I might kill you at any moment. We might die. And he basically said, they said, I will put these wires together and we'll all be dead. Mm-hmm. And I think she was horrified. And you can, you can almost see that in the Unsolved Mystery sketch she does, right? She's seeing the face of Satan, essentially. I mean, you know, that, in, that sketch that she drew is so menacing looking. <laughs> yeah. It's like that was her view of him saying, hey, you know. It was like that one second of I'll connect the wires. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> that was like, just like in her brain. So maybe yeah. she would recognize him. I don't know. But they would. Yeah. I don't think I don't think the, the FBI, the government is all about not wasting resources. And that's why they quit following Cooper. In fact, right. I would like to ask Larry Carr when they quit even caring to a point, because Larry did this as a hobby case. Like literally yeah. it was a hobby. It was like, hey, can I have the Cooper case? I don't give a damn here. Sure. But in the 70s, they had case agents assigned to it, and that was their mm-hmm. job, mm-hmm. right? So when did they stop caring? What year? You know, so I don't know that the that the U.S. Attorney's Office would invest any time in that. I, they may just take his word for it and say, you know what? Hell, this guy's Cooper. You know, have at it, folks. If you want to interview him, and, you know, I mean, whatever. I mean, right. I just don't see them wasting resources, especially if they couldn't prove it. Right. Um, and... I mean, look, if he had a freaking parachute, that was the parachute. Yeah. Now having a Cooper 20, I don't know if that'd be enough because he could have gotten that from the, from the real Cooper and. Right, right, right. So So it essentially come down to finding the hair slide, the supposed palm print or fingerprint on the magazine or, or, or DNA on the tie. And And again, it would have to be one of those. And that palm (laughs) print, they really like that palm print because I mean, I think they are, because if you look at the Rackstraw 302s, now he has been um, unredacted or yeah, unredacted, I guess. His 302s, you can see if you can search for Rackstraw on the 302s and it'll pop up, you know. Mm-hmm. So his 302s aren't his name's on there. Most people's names are not. Um, but they really wanted to get his palm print. So like there's this big that there's this mad dash to get Rackstraw's palm print. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now, this is back in 78. Uh, he was on trial for murdering his stepdad and he pretty much did it. But he yeah. got away with it. Um, yeah. Rackstraw was not a good dude, um, which yeah. is. But people, people joke it couldn't have been Rackstraw because Rackstraw would have jumped and then blown the plane up. You know, <laughs> he, was a, he was a crazy guy. Yeah, I'll give him and, that. And, and so, yeah, th- it wouldn't have. Um, but the palm print, maybe, because what it was is the palm print is that Cooper got up from his chair and pushed down on his chair, and, and they, they think it's. Yeah, they're pretty sure that's his because it came off of the, actually his chair. Because the first thing they did that night uh, when the plane landed, they actually unscrewed uh, his the, the, the whole row of seats he sat on. They unscrewed it and mm-hmm. took it with them. You know, they carried it out the plane mm-hmm. in the actual row mm-hmm. of seats. Um, I don't know where – I, I would like to know where those seats are now. That's actually a cool – that'd be a cool thing to have in a museum. Absolutely. Where Tina – where Tina, because, I mean, basically, if you, had, if you had all three seats, you would have the seat where Tina and Flo sat. You'd have Cooper's seat. Yep. And, and you'd have the seat where his briefcase was, uh, which is pretty cool. So you could like rearrange like a mock, uh, kind of like the scene of the crime. Yeah, that'd be thing, neat to you know, have that in a museum. That'd be a cool, but I don't know where those are. I, I, I'd like to know where that is. Cool question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it, it, it's definitely interesting, uh, interesting stuff as, as far as uh, how, it would, uh, how it would all break down. Uh, one, one wild thing I heard you mention uh, is um, this kind of goes back to, you know, the, the vortex type stuff, but uh, the the mention of James Earl Ray in the 302s and and how uh, Joe mentioned that and like that is I just thought that was crazy. You know what I mean? Like the the type of stuff that you know obviously it kind of got leaked out before, so it just brings up a lot of questions there of like how that's like even possible. You know what so, I mean? So James Earl Ray he comes up because of uh, there's a an early Cooper suspect was a guy named Jack Cofelt. Now, Jack Cofelt was this kind of confidence man um, who liked to tell tales, okay? And he was apparently apparently really good at it. Um, and he basically spun some yarn in the mid-70s, maybe 75, 76. He was an ex-con. He had been in prison for like 10 years for a bank robbery or something like that. Well, he took a man, like a buddy of his who was about 45 or so, and his like 15-year-old son up into the woods around Ariel and was like, hey, this is uh, – where we jumped and this is where I landed. It's kind of like, you know, showing out the, the landmarks. And, he, and, and um, allegedly his picture was shown to, I mean, this is all, I think, bullshit. But 
he alleged uh, the the friend of his wrote or the maybe it was a son in the eighties or something wrote a book about Cofelt about being shown the Cooper sites by Cofelt and somehow he claims that he got a picture in front of Flo Schaffner of his mugshot and Flo said I never Flo said I thought I'd never see that face again right I mean mm-hmm. I think it's bullshit um, it, it certainly is um, sounds good but apparently he actually was a cellmate of James Earl Ray. At, 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 at some point. And sure. that was what what happened is we believe that Joe Weber annoyed the piss out of some FBI agent and was allowed to actually see the 302s and go through it for some amount mm-hmm. of time. Because mm-hmm. Joe Weber knew, you know, knew things that we did not know until recently. Um, Joe Weber knew about the, the Heisen store being burglarized that night mm-hmm. well before any of us knew about it. Mm-hmm. Um, several other things. And the fact that she was mentioning James Earl Ray really early on, on drop zone forums in like 2008, 2009, I was, I was, mm-hmm. this is what back when I was reading it in law school. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I wasn't even a member yet. I, I didn't sign up until 2015 or so, but I, I remember reading all this stuff. And I remember her talking about James Earl Ray. I was like, that's so stupid. You know, but, but what it was is that she saw, I, I'm almost certain her, her yarn was that, that was that Dwayne was a cellmate of James Earl Ray. And it's yeah. like, where the hell does that that come from? And how does it tie into Cooper? Had to be that she saw this 302 about James Earl Ray being a cellmate to, to Cooper. Mm-hmm. And she just, I mean, I often, I often use the phrase Forrest Gump. She Forrest Gumps him. She Forrest yeah. Gump Dwayne. Like, you know, Forrest Gump is there with John Lennon on the Dick Cavett show. You know, Forrest Gump is there when MLK is giving his speech. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, is yeah, he yeah. Every president? historical moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so like every, everything with the vortex she would CGI, you know, <laughs> and, and yeah. always, she's like, you know, and like, you know, there was a thing on the group the other day about how somebody, you know, showed a video of a beached whale. And I was like, Joe Weber probably said, me and Dwayne were watching TV and Dwayne said, that's the whale that swallowed D.B. Cooper. And I said, <laughs> well, who's D.B. Cooper? Yeah. And then yeah, he changed the yeah. channel real quick. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I saw like, the comment. Everything would be spun into DB Cooper. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so, but, but she actually, I, I don't tell people this. I, I'll, I'll tell it on your show. I spoke to Joe Weber one time. And this is before I was even like, I mean, hell, I've not been, I've not been, really been on, I mean, I was making posts in 2015, 2016, but I wasn't like an active person that people would know who I am. Mm-hmm. But somehow Joe Weber learned that there was a member of the of the uh, drop zone who was a prosecutor in Mississippi. And uh, Joe Weber actually somehow found me. Well, I guess it wasn't hard. My, my old Miss Cub is my is my Twitter name, too. So I guess she, maybe mm-hmm. she she was savvy enough for her age. Anyway, she called me sure. and I got a call one time and it was like, Ryan. And I was like, I was like, who's this? She goes, Joe Weber. And I was like, oh, Whoa, Joe. I was, like, I was like, what's going on? And she goes, uh, and she started talking about how, you know, she thinks that she thinks that uh Dwayne, she goes, Do you think that Dwayne would have been involved in the assassination of Medgar Evers? Now, those who don't know Medgar Evers was the end he was the NAACP secretary. He was assassinated in Jackson, Mississippi by a guy named mm-hmm. Iron Dale Beckwith. There's a movie about it called Ghost of Mississippi. Uh James Woods was nominated for an Oscar for it. Anyway, I'll check uh, it out. Byron Dale Beckwith is in the 302s. The, the assassin of Megar Evers because somebody sent in an article where there's a photo of Jan, of, of uh, Byron Ella Beck with the assassin in wearing a skinny tie and somebody sent it to the FBI saying this looks like DB Cooper you know and oh god I'm like Joe must have seen that because in what world yeah. do you associate the assassin of Megar Evers to DB Cooper I mean so yeah, I, I could never make that reach no and so but she <laughs> had to have done that and she knows that I was a prosecutor in the area where this happened. And she was like, do you think this was a connection? I was like, no, you know, so, um, that was, a. Uh, but yeah, I talked to Joe Weber one time and I, I, I tried to make, this was near the end of her, like, she kind of went downhill there at the end a lot mentally. Right. I don't right. like telling that story because it makes her look even crazier than she really was, but, but no, uh, James, but, but, but it's pretty interesting to me. I was I was super intrigued by the James Earl Bray thing. Just I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying there's any connection here, but just the yeah. overall thing and that there's it even goes further is uh, is definitely highly interesting. There was uh, unrelated. There was a question. Did anyone ever say anything about uh, uh, Cooper wearing cologne? Uh, I don't really I don't recall that or don't. don't no, know. 
the answer to that. So absolutely it's, not. And as far as um, uh, what was I gonna say with Tom K? You mentioning you mentioning Tom K talking about um the, the, the agent told him that 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 they most likely were oh um, oh yeah so so Larry her. yeah 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 <laughs> so Larry Carr I said, no it was Tom K. Uh, Tom K actually told Larry, he's like, you know what? Why don't you offer an amnesty? amnesty? If y'all aren't going to prosecute him, just say, hey, look, if you're D.B. Cooper, we will not prosecute you. Come forward and let us shake hands on it. Hey, man, well played game. You avoided us for 40 years. The FBI does not lose many of these things mm -hmm. ever. And so, you know, they may have had a shaking of the hand like, you know, Tupac and Biggie, Tupac and Biggie or something. It's like. Okay, yeah, you know, sure. well played game. Call, you, it, call it a stalemate or something. Yeah, and Larry goes, "That's a damn good idea." And Larry asked his boss, and they said, "No." So yeah, he brought it to his higher up, and they shot it down, which is like, it's, yeah. that's crazy. Thanks. So uh, that's wild. So I, and as far as it, since you brought up Larry, as far as it dropping off, I mean, honestly, I feel like it lost a lot of steam late seventies and maybe it rekindled after the uh, the Tina Bar yeah. right money fine, Easily. but then. By late 80s, I don't know, I mean, it's from what I know, you don't really see much going on. So by 90s, I have to assume that it pretty much cooled off, you know? Yeah, the last the last completely. instance of the, so the, the the hair slide is sent around hot and heavy a lot mm -hmm. in the 70s and the 80s. And the last time we see the hair slide being used to like verify or, you know, a suspect or not mm -hmm. is in about 86. So right. in a way that tells me that they quit even like, doing this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I tell the story on the Vortex podcast that there's a 302 where uh, the FBI office in Dallas in 1979 has to go look up the newspaper from that from 1971 because they don't know what day the Cooper hijacked. Yeah, they didn't know the date. That was that was ridiculous. That story blew my mind. I was yeah. like, are you kidding me? Like, it says that they're like, they're like, oh, we, they're like, we had to go consult a paper to figure out when this hijacking happened. It's like, that's total nonsense and it's not like any any major crimes happened in dallas right guys in the uh in the 60s yeah, I, so, yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh ryan peaked my radar when he had this discovery of the 1937 air trails magazine and i'm a big uh fanboy of the dan cooper comic book that's because i'm from the zodiac community where there's a massive uh comic book connection to the Zodiac case, I just like to think that these, you know, late 60s, 70s cases both have uh, comic book connections, which is hilarious because when Eric was on the show, you know, he's no nonsense. So he's like, I mean, what kind of 40 year old man reads comic books seriously? And I was it's like, uh, oh, 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 so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for but for the Cooper parallel as well. Uh, but, you know, I really like what you found because. Um, for one, you know how you have the uh, the, the hero rescue, which that like uh, that guy's like before and after the Dan Cooper comic strip, and then Milton has a connection, like a fam yeah. familial so, connection to that. What <clears throat> it is is basically so I was like, you know, I just wanted, I was just, I, I wasn't expecting to find anything. I just like, you know, I want to see if there's any other Dan Coopers in fiction, you know, and um, there there were some after the Cooper hijacking. Mm -hmm. There was like. I think Louis Lamore, the guy that wrote a bunch, bunch of westerns, had a Dan Cooper guy, but it was after the hijacking. Right, I kept right. going back, and if you look in, and there was an interior designer named Dan Cooper of note, apparently. Um, but yeah. I kept going back, and then I found this thing, and I was like, okay, what is this? And I opened it up, and I'm like, oh my god, it's a, a jetliner, and it's got images of parachutes. I'm mm -hmm. like, whoa, what is this? And like I tell people, the Dan Cooper is a seven or eight page short story. And his name is used maybe nine or 10. I mean, his name is used about 50 times. I believe I counted it. It's like 48 times the, the name Dan Cooper, not just Cooper, Dan Cooper. So, I mean, he's never called Dan. He's never called Cooper. It's called Dan Cooper. So Dan Cooper you know, got in the cockpit. Dan Cooper punched this guy in the face. Dan Cooper laughed. Dan Cooper. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. a very Dan Cooper. Dan Cooper. It's, it's a literary device, essentially, by the author, um, who was a pretty well-published author at the time. But uh, I was like, okay. 1937, let's just say Cooper's, you know, born in 1925. This is something a 12 year old might read, but it's, it's a, it's a weird magazine. If you, if you story, if you flip, if you flip through this magazine called air trails, uh, it's got like some technical, it's got a bunch of technical articles in there about aviation, like some sort of really technical high, high heady things, but it also has like mm -hmm. comics. So it, it's a really, it's all of I can't figure out who the target audience is. It could be 12 year olds or 25 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> it's really strange, but anyway, it's very interesting. Yeah, so I was looking at it, and um, I I noticed that the page before Cooper, 
start but the page before this comic uh, uh, the page before the short story starts and like the page after is the same guy it's about this guy named clyde pangborn now they called clyde pangborn the limburg of the west he was the first person to fly from uh america to japan nonstop. um so, so they, they sure. called him the limburg of the west well i started i was like oh, clyde pangborn well i looked at it some more and i go oh, oh shoot clyde pangborn's from the same hometown as milton Bordal essentially i was like oh okay and then i you know we looked up you know we started doing newspaper searches for vordile and pangborn and we Ooh. found out that their mothers were on the same like bridge team and it's like yeah i heard you mention that that's what? crazy so <laughs> you know if any suspect was ever to have this random magazine it it, it would be the suspect who where that where the guy before cooper and the guy after the cooper story was a family friend right Hey, let's get the, you know, hey, hey, you know, my bridge, you know, my, my, you know, my, uh, you know, my bridge partner, Edna, you know, her son is going to be featured in this magazine. Let's get it. You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For I mean, sure. And, and again, I, I tell people, think about like, I, I'm not sure how, I, I mean, I mean, how old are you, Ross? I'm 37. Okay. So like, you're, you're close to my age. I'm 40. So when, when we were younger, before the internet was really a thing, if you had like a magazine or something, you read that magazine cover to cover all the time, right? You know your media was limited or it's like you watch the same dvd or video a million times right because it was like oh this is my magazine this is my little book well imagine that during the great depression if you had a magazine that that wasn't i mean you know you probably didn't have many others you know so um i could see them reading this magazine hey my buddy's in this magazine and flipping through it over and over again right and so that was a cool connection now again might have nothing to do with nothing but right I dare you to find a better to find a suspect who has more of a reason to have owned this obscure magazine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than Vordal. Um, now, to throw some cold water on this, um, I asked McNally on the phone. I said, Robert Wilson, I said, uh, what does this mean? He goes, they mean a goddamn thing. I was like, oh, OK, your alias meant nothing. He said, no, I just picked it because it sounded easy to remember. I was like, oh, OK. So his alias was Robert Wilson, and he just picked it out of thin air. Meant nothing at all to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, that. well, okay, maybe it means nothing. Maybe the alias means nothing because it was easy. To, it was easy to remember. Oh, Dan Cooper's easy, easy to remember too. So, I mean, maybe. But um, you know, in your world though, um, in the Zodiac world, uh, was that you know, cryptography and things like that. Signs matter a lot. Oh yeah. Um, now whether Cooper was a McNally or you know, was some genius scientist we don't know um i will say though that cooper's behavior he's the only skyjacker that i know of there's a great book called the skies belong to us which is about all the skyjackings in the 70s and 60s and every skyjacker is manic when they're they're, they're nervous they're sweating they're like yeah. mentally ill they're just like out of McCoy control style. and mcnally tried to keep us cool and then lost it and like it went shit went crazy afterwards cooper is the only one who's like calm the whole way through essentially um he was different there was something different about db cooper um oh, yeah. you know and, he, and even like mcnally has reference for has reverence for cooper he's like oh he's the guy who invented it he's the he's the he's the mastermind of this thing i couldn't he, you know, mcnally says mcnally was a small town crook he was like mcnally like his 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 little scam was he somehow like counterfeited quarters so he would go around like buying cigarettes out of out of out of vending machines and reselling them, you know. <laughs> I love it. With his fake quarters he made. I mean, it was just like, he was a small oh, yeah. time crook. That's straight out of Trailer Park Boys. Yeah, exactly. He was just a nobody. <laughs> so That's his great. reverence for the guy who actually thought of the thing was like pretty high. Oh well, Cooper's the blueprint, and uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, here's here's my theory because we're going to speculate because it's Cooper and no one really knows anything. In Zodiac, we have this thing called synchronicity, and it's kind of like mm -hmm. you know what you, what you guys talk with like the uh, the who's the culprit uh, article being the most vortex thing ever. You know, you start to there's all these reasons why Zodiac um, you know ch chooses the name Zodiac, and all these different you know the most dangerous game. There's this character named Count Zaroff, and you know Zorro, and the list goes on. You know Z Z Z. Well. The way that that Dan Cooper comic strip is written, you know, Dan Cooper threw a punch, Dan Cooper flew his jet. Yeah. It really makes me think that it 
it it ultimately becomes his alter ego. I mean, this is this is just you know, in my theory, lining up the Dan Cooper French uh, Belgian comic book with this American comic book. When you see the same thing over and over again, okay, if I ever have to skyjack a seven twenty seven, I'm using that. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's, 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 I mean, if, it's, if, if if I'm ever gonna play Sandlot baseball, I'm gonna use the name Scotty Smalls. You know. Like the sandlot, yeah. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Right, exactly, right. So the who, who's the real culprit? Excuse me, Nikki. And uh, so you know the Z chronicity. This is Coopernicity or Dan chronicity. Uh, I was about the, the vortex. We call the right, vortex. Right, that, that too. And you know what I mean. So it's like you know, it, it, you know, a, again with the, uh, the the Norwegian sky title, and then obviously we'll we'll come to later the grudge and what you pointed out with the Don Cooper thing. It's like. Uh, it, it, not to go off on a side note, but Michael Butterfield has this episode in the Zodiac A to Z uh, podcast where he literally does a whole episode of all the Z references. There's like, um, what's uh, Zoltar, that talking head in the movie Big with Tom yeah. Hanks, you know, yeah. that was on the, the San Francisco Bay uh, boardwalk. So mm -hmm. literally, you know, if you were to line up every Z, there's, you know, probably about 100 of them and, and you kind of get the same thing here. So that that phrasing really struck me of what you pointed out with like the Dan Cooper throws a punch, Dan, the kind yeah. of third person. It's very Zodiac esque in how Zodiac says, "This is the Zodiac speaking." He refers to himself in the in the third person, you know. So that's what I think of when I heard that Dan Cooper throws a punch, and then it's like, now maybe he only used that alter ego for five hours on flight three hundred five, but that's kind of how I view it for for five hours he became it was more than just an alias to me it was uh he became this alter ego with the james bondian suit and the alias and that even the cool calm demeanor as you said for he became that character for five hours of the flight 305 yeah you know? and, and i mean look <laughs> the thing with vordal is that you know look i mean we'll get into him in a second but it, it's like with cooper though you have the dan cooper you have the dan cooper short short story that he, he had a reason to own when he was younger but then, he, but then you have him being fired or losing his job, um, you know, or, or, be, or working with a guy named Don. Even if he didn't fire him, he worked his, – his supervisor at Ty, Timet was a guy named Don Cooper. Mm -hmm. And then we have – we found out just last week that, um, that, that Milton uh, – that one of his buddies on the Manhattan Project was named uh, Milton Cooper. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there you God go. almighty. So, like – uh, As you said, with the vortex – lining up references and that's yeah, you know, just, like it, a, something cooper never left his brain somehow 100 percent. yeah that's what i think i mean i mean drew, drew is in the chat and he's kind of you know one of my mentors in the zodiac community so he knows what we're talking about uh one thing i was not aware of in your work was what you mentioned on the uh, vortex podcast which is your contributions to the uh the db cooper um wikipedia page and oh my gosh those stories were hilarious of you battling those admins back and forth and running that one guy off i was i was so thoroughly entertained um yeah i was not aware that you had done all the all the behind the scenes work uh which was which was super interesting i i've got it on the page a, shit a couple show. times it was a shit show like just months ago hilarious. i mean look hilarious. they had db cooper sitting in the wrong seat like, four months <laughs> that's ago. bad I mean, I know it's Wikipedia, but what the hell, guys? Well, I mean, it's the it, biggest it, it, skyjacking it, 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 case it, 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 ever. Wikipedia actually is not the worst because you do have to, like, cite. You, For sure. It requires a resource. It requires yeah. sites, right? It, mm -hmm. But the problem is because we, we were reliant on – but because we didn't know much about the case for 45 years before the, before the FOIA stuff came out, mm -hmm. we were relying on – random articles that could that could that, that could have that could have been wrong so somebody mm -hmm. wrote an art somebody, somebody somebody wrote for esquire some article saying oh he sat in seat 18 18 you know b or whatever it was bill mitchell's yeah. seat right <laughs> yeah it's great you know but again this is esquire it must be true right right, right. and so and, and because it's esquire it's allowed on the wikipedia page but no i had to basically like i hope they don't see this I hope no admin see this but like i had to like <laughs> bruce was the sacrificial lamb um, for Drew Beeson, um, because I added a bunch of sources for Drew and Bruce at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, Drew's book is self-published. Um, in a you know, it's a small publishing company thing, and a um, uh, 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 Bruce's book is actually a small, a, a, a not a publisher of note, right? Um, so, um, that neither neither Bruce nor Drew's book about Braden technically should be allowed right 
And so right. it got this huge, like I, I posted, all, I, I added all these Bruce Smith things on there, which mm-hmm. to me, Bruce is a great resource. I added all these Bruce things oh, on there. Yeah, and um, the, and, and at the same time, I added Drew, Drew, Drew stuff, right? So I added a bunch of Drew stuff and a bunch of Bruce stuff, Bruce stuff. And they were like, this Bruce guy says he has sex with aliens. He can't be trusted. <laughs> you know? And I'm That's like, exactly why I trust him. I know. And I had to be like, you know, I understand. I, I, I get it. I get it. But he's really good at Cooper. Trust me. And they're like, we don't believe it. You know? <laughs> and, and so finally, I removed all of Bruce's stuff. And I said, okay, guys. Okay. I removed the self-publishing stuff. Not removing Drew. Got so, him. And so they forgot about Drew because they're like, oh, oh, oh like, yeah, so they were jumping up and down for joy that they got rid of the sex with aliens guy. Yeah. And so, yeah. but I hey, was Bruce, able to. Bruce, Bruce covers a lot of material. You bet he yeah, covers so, a lot of material. And so I, it was like, he was like the, he was like the, uh, um, um, the fluffy squeaky toy saying, look, I'm removing Bruce. And, and, and it allowed Drew to stay there. So, so good. They forgot about Drew and they still forget about Drew. Drew is on there. Um, Drew's great book, you know, Petro Fortune is allowed on the wiki page. Oh, yeah. Only because Love they forgot Drew. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go go pick up Drew's book on uh, what Drew, DrewBeasonBooks.com, I believe, Drew. And uh, drop your link in the chat if you like, Drew. And uh, go check that out on Amazon, guys. That was actually the first Cooper book uh, I read. So we have James Coleman saying that Braden was likely one of the first suspects that they looked into. Yeah. I don't know be. about that. I don't know. I mean, maybe, be. maybe. But with all the uh, Singlob and all those guys holding him down, I, I don't see anything happening to him, he's whether weird. they looked into him or not. He got away with a lot. He got away God. with a lot. You know? He's weird. So. He's so weird. I mean, look, I'll, I'll, I'll hit on Braden real quick. Um, I know Braden was on your list, but we'll, we'll go there yeah, We can come back to him later, but we can do it now. Go, go for but, it. I mean, I'll go now. I mean, like. Go. Braden is my like. I, I, I almost want a T-shirt saying Braden is my homeboy. Like, <laughs> I love Ted Braden so much. I love him. That's why I want to talk him with you. Like, I love Braden so much. But the issue—it's like you know, regardless of Cooper stuff, Braden's life should yeah, be a Tarantino it's, movie. It's, it's insane, you know. That's, but but, but the, the issue I have with Ted, favorite. and I know Lisa and uh, Drew in the chat. One thing that an issue with Ted is not height. It's not any of that stuff. My thing is, look, they knew at the time, hey, we have an asshole, expert skydiver, Mac V. Sog team leader, driving a driving a freaking eighteen wheeler around the country. Man, if Ted Braden is not like suspect number four, you know, then then they're not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. I did not go. Hey, it's it, look because I mean, Ted Braden was already on their radar because he had published his ramparts article in 67 yeah 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 and like they launched congressional they launched congressional um hearings about mac v sog because of ted Mm -hmm. so they knew this guy they knew his capability so my point is is that we have all these 302s where very early on they are showing pictures of they are showing pictures of suspects to the flight to tina and them right and tina's going oh he's too good looking or Mm -hmm. whatever so it's like I really wonder if I'm going to poo-poo Ted, I have to think that maybe they would have been shown Ted's picture really early on and said, that's nah, not him. Because yeah. how could they not? Now, we'll never know. B- because, again, things that are classified status. don't get in the 302. <clears throat> yeah. And so they never. Th- there are no documents in the Cooper file from 1971 that are ever going to mention Mac Vsog. They're just not right. going to. Right. And so right. redactions are not even, right. I, mean, they, I mean, redactions are not covering up Mac V. Sog in 302s because right. there's no Mac V. Sog reference in a 302 ever because it was classified right. at the time. So right. we're never going to know, um, you know, what they, you know, I mean, I don't know, but I mean, th- I mean, I don't know. So I mean. For those who don't know, uh, uh, Ryan and, and uh, Nikki and the team have created a searchable database of the 302s. So th- things like that, you guys should be able to uh, find pretty quickly. Obviously, Mac V saw classified stuff, as you just said, is not going to be in there. Um, but I don't know. I mean, Ted just has this. I'm, I'm a bit of a Ted guy, a uh, bit of a braiding guy, a la Drew. And he just had this untouchable status. I mean, the, the stealing truckloads out of Gloucester. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm from Massachusetts, you know what I mean, originally. Uh, so <laughs> it's just, I don't know. I didn't, the Fort the Fort Dix thing that I think was that, I, 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 or I think it was um, Chris Williamson and, and uh, Darren that we're talking about in that yeah. Vortex episode. It's just like, I see so many of those, and then I just get the feeling of like, 
nothing's going to happen to this that guy <laughs> because, it, because it never has. Because it never yeah, has. I mean, you know? look, look, I mean, literally, and that is not a lie. I mean, a, a, a <clears throat> lieutenant colonel in the JAG said that the that said, said that the the Joint Chief of Staff for the U.S. Army called them and said, "Hey, uh, release him." Basically. Yeah, not I mean, enough M- MPs at Fort Dix. Ridiculous. This is literally reason. the highest ranking general mm-hmm. in the U.S. Army at the time mm-hmm. called just to tell them to release Ted Braden. It's mm-hmm. like, holy crap. You know, and so, and again, you know, I, you know, we have all these things where Ted is arrested for yep. various yep. things. The but DWI with no ID. But I, look, I've got access to some records. I've got access as a lawyer to a thing called yep. PACER, which is the F, which is a federal databases for, for yep. criminal files. Braden's not in there, yeah, he's okay, a ghost. at all. He doesn't so like, ghost. And, and so what? It's almost like I almost think about like if if he was ever arrested, somebody it's like Rambo. You know, somebody showed up and said, "Ted, you messed up again, but will you do a job for us?" <laughs> yeah, it's you know, exactly what I think of when I when I read Drew's book. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's got to be what it is because there's never yeah. a follow up. It's always Ted Braden's arrested for for stealing a car. Ted Braden's yeah. arrested for hauling. You know, yeah. uh, a, a whole freight load of stolen goods through yeah, meat Massachusetts, and fish. but then yeah. there's never a follow-up article yeah. about. We never find out what happens to him. No, nothing. And there's not does. even a case file for it. Right, right. It's, no paper trail. So that's. Yeah. I mean, it, I got to give it to Drew. If there's a guy who's going to ride off into the sunset for being Cooper and not face any consequences, it's Braden. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, mean? If, if you so. could invent again, it, it's like Drew had the easiest. Drew had the easiest and the worst time ever writing a book because it's it's the easiest to write a book on on Braden because he's the easiest suspect to like make fit right, mm-hmm. but he's the hardest suspect because of how mysterious he is right. There's there's right. so few sources. Right. Fighting actual. People, I, look, it's like if you gave I say this and I, I will go to my grave saying this. If you gave a hundred people like basically the 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 three hundred twos, and you said, hey, I want you to to invent a fictional DB Cooper. 85% would invent Ted Braden. This guy who's, you know, he has designed these sort of missions before. He's the, he taught the Vietnamese soldiers how to, how to, how to skydive into trees. Oh, yeah. He literally taught the Vietnamese special forces how to, how to skydive into trees. So it's like, how could you invent a better person to do this? But 100%. again, look, I mean, regardless, you can talk about shoe lifts and everything. Braden's a little short. I mean, that's kill me. Well, He's almost too good, as you were just saying. I mean, my art, you know, if nobody's going to take Braden for the uh, myst- uh, the mystery group uh, suspect series, I think I might take Braden just to, to lay out the pros and cons. And that's because one of my arguments would be almost overqualified with the thousands of halo jumps. And it's like yeah. one position I've kind of evolved on off you guys' REM crew panel is that um, I don't think you really need thousands of jumps to be Cooper, especially the fact that McNally mm-hmm. and the five copycats all made it to the ground you know uh, uh, M- marty andrade's uh research with the uh the the world war ii uh j- jump pilots and all that stuff so it's it's uh, I'm, I'm kind of evolving on that position but yeah um, it, I, you know. I look i mean if you look at look the only the only copycats who were skydivers were mccoy and heady and they they're the only ones who brought their own parachutes mm-hmm. skydivers i mean you talk to like mark mark meltzer you know who's a great guy mark meltzer has been jumping for 50 years Mm-hmm. Mark Meltzer is like Mark Meltzer is like there is no way in hell I would ever jump without a parachute that I knew who packed it who you well know. especially coming from the FBI <laughs> amidst a yeah. ransom they have a lot of reasons to sabotage now, your now here's the thing so, so McNally requested five parachutes McNally actually opened three of them and pulled mm-hmm. on the shroud lines to make sure they weren't mm-hmm. cut so his thinking mm-hmm. was okay you know they didn't say he took he took a chance you know McNally took a chance um, mm-hmm. but again. Uh, yeah, I mean, he just trusted that they didn't give him rags in the one that he chose. You know, I mean, it could have been. Yeah. You know, yeah. But but again, him now, now Himmelsbach always said the FBI didn't have the authority to execute anybody, and that's what that would have been if they had, you know, sabotaged his parachute. So kind kind of agree, but at the same time, with the m- m- McCoy's it. McCoy's ending and the fact that, uh, as Darren said, one of their plans was to like try to go under the lavatory and shoot through the bottom of the plane to kill Cooper. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they had a cowboyish cavalier attitude back we, then. You know? we, again, so, Mc- McNally was interesting. The field agents. So you know? McNally's remember his first seven twenty seven was wrecked by the drunk who crashed into it. Um, he got a he got a second seven twenty seven with a different flight crew. It turns mm-hmm. out that the flight engineer 
on the second twenty on the second seven twenty seven was an FBI agent undercover. So interesting. When he, when he transferred planes, it was an FBI agent who was that they had snuck on the plane. So, um, yeah. you know, as you said, yeah, things could have gone wrong. A sky marshal, or you know what I mean. Oh, and, and, and there is some there is there is a scenario where um, so if you read the actual transcript of the Cooper case, um, somebody tried to go back on board. So when the passengers get off, there's a moment when in, in the air traffic control uh, audio, which again we know somebody, Nikki, put 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 down the smoke, Nikki. Let's get these audio tapes. There is a woman we know who has these audio tapes, but they're of the of the original hijacker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, in the in the high in the audio, uh, we have the transcripts. Uh, Radchek says, "Hey, there is a passenger who keeps trying to come back up the stairs." Okay. And apparently Alice Hancock or one of the stews literally pushed them away saying, you can't do this, sir. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's Tosaw says that it was an overeager FBI agent who was like, let me get at him. Let me get at him. And they're yeah. like, no, 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 no. You're not doing yeah, this. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm you not know, saying the policy is going to come from the, you know, the reporting, you know, FBI, you know, like the, the, the heads of the, of the project, but like, one of those random, you know, cowboy field agents that they might act, you know, out of impulse and you're sure. not necessarily going to be able to control the situation. You know what I mean? It, so, it happened. But, I mean, look, it, I mean, they, they killed us thing is uh, three of, so three of the Cooper copycats who didn't make it to the ground were killed mm -hmm. during their attempts. They were shot and killed by the FBI agent. So like there were, I believe 13 different Cooper copycats in 1972. We know mm -hmm. about, we know, we know five because they made it out the plane. But right. three of those 13 were actually killed by the FBI. They have it. So, so yeah. they were shot. We're, so we're, yeah, we're not talking about some like impossible outlandish no. theory <laughs> here when it actually ha happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about let's talk explosives, because this is another uh, another aspect that I've evolved on. You know, I, I came on the group with you guys a while back and I always thought that the bomb was fake. You wouldn't risk blowing up the money, um, you know, that's just, and then, I, and then, I, that my theory was that he used the road flares to signal his accomplice on the ground. So it's actually whatever painted road yeah. flares, road flares in the in the uh, Atasay case. So, but once you guys started talking about Milton and started, you know, I've, I've evolved on this from you, you, you and Nikki's recent interviews and just you know points you guys have made in the group, and that's the fact that going back to our previous uh, topic, if he were to get cornered and get backed up against a wall. I totally agree with you guys. I don't think he would just get arrested or Milton or Cooper in general would just get arrested, give himself up, you know, face on the front page of the New York Times. I, I just I don't see that happening. So no. I, I, and then there's also the thing about um, was it Tina or whoever when they recreated the drawing of the bomb and they actually tested it. Nikki was saying it actually went yeah. off. So based yeah. on what people have, it's a sound technical reasoning for a live explosive. Yeah, so basically, we at CooperCon uh, on Sunday, not Sunday night. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, Tom Voigt and his wife were there, as, as you know, the Zodiac people. Yeah, uh, I was with you guys. Oh wait, you were there that night on Sunday night. I was, I was there on Sunday night. Oh, That's you were okay. Yeah, so we're sitting yeah. there and we're having a live session, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we're trying to figure out if uh, you know if the battery on the uh, aircraft, uh, you know, or if the battery in the bomb could have. Set off, charge. could have put have popped the blasting caps for dynamite and it could have yep. we determined that the battery could have done that um and also we realized that that road flares are longer tina said that the dynamite sticks are about eight inches long road flares are generally generally longer than that mm -hmm. um and there is red there is red dynamite we have found red dynamite oddly enough oddly enough dupont who cooper worked for i mean well Vordal worked for um mm -hmm. had red dynamite sticks but and dynamite was actually easy to find um in Oregon and Washington at the time, we, we Googled this um, because farmers would use it to blow up beaver dams and things because water is really mm -hmm. like you need water, you know, in that area of the country. And you're in California, you know, water is necessary and you can't have oh, yeah. you can't have rivers backed up. Right. So farmers would blow the hell out of these dams. So it's easy to find dynamite. But, yeah, mm -hmm. the thing is, I actually asked McNally about this and McNally thinks the bomb was fake, you know, because his bomb was fake. But then I said, hey. Matt, what if Cooper is, you know, you were a young man still. You had a lot of life ahead of you. Mm -hmm. What if you were 50 years old? Would your give a frack button be already pushed, right? I'm not going to prison. Screw it. I'm dead. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. 
and yeah, spend you know, less it, of your now goes well yeah now that you say that probably mm -hmm. um so i think that cooper had a way to kill himself now 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 we learn a lot from mcnally's mystery bag so mcnally had a mystery bag which is like there's so much symmetry of his kids you know McNally's mystery bag, he had goggles in there or no he didn't have goggles he had um he, mcnally had a change of clothes um mcnally had or some some clothes in there he had a pistol in there and a flashlight um he uh had um some he had some rope he had uh, tape to like tape some things to him i mean he had some things in a mystery bag okay um that was interesting but he had a pistol in there too and when i did my animation i did a experiment of cooper's mystery bag i found a bag in my garage mm -hmm. of my wife's that was the same size and mm -hmm. I, I i i included a pistol in there because hey you know you get on the ground you get a cougar attacks you i mean who knows bigfoot tries to shoot you or <laughs> yeah, to kill yourself i mean because I mean, you want to go to prison. I mean, look, and again, hijacking had a death penalty. It was a death penalty case, actually, at the time. So, I mean, point. McCoy was actually probably going to be sentenced to death. But the Supreme Court overturned uh, the death penalty literally the day of his sentencing. I mean, literally <laughs> the day. The That's judge, interesting. There's a transcript. The judge of the, of, the, of the McCoy hijacking said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to announce to you that the burden on you to sentence him is, is over. The Supreme Court just just and just overturned the death penalty, so it was on the table. So, but again, um, I think a family man, a guy who actually had children, and our suspect Bordal had four kids. We had five mm -hmm. kids, but four that he claimed, I guess, at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, they absolutely. If Cooper had no identification on him, and they could not have identified him any other way, they would have cleaned his face up. And they had to put his dead face on the on the paper. They would oh, have. Yeah. I've seen this. Look, there's a photograph of uh, Merlin St. James was one of the Cooper copycats. There's a photograph of him splayed out on the pavement from where the FBI blew his head off. It's like Jeez. hijacking gone wrong. And here's a oh, guy God. on the ground. It's like, holy shit. <laughs> so the I mean, they'd have put, they put somebody's face on there. You know, oh, help yeah. us identify this man, right? Yeah. So you, if you detonate a bomb, you not only kill yourself, but you destroy the evidence, right? You destroy your body. Now, these days, we could run DNA on the fragments. I mean, like, to be gruesome, you know, the 9-11 bodies, you know, a lot of the 9-11 people were identified solely through DNA because their bodies were torn apart. Right. You know, folks on the aircraft, you know, mm -hmm. um, an explosion. But back then, they couldn't. So, yeah, the bomb, gosh, man, Cooper is so different than all the other people who did this that we'll never know. Um, but it could have been a real bomb. I mean, it wasn't, look, the thing is he didn't need to, it didn't need to be a real bomb. I mean, he could have had a ham sandwich in the briefcase and said, there is a bomb in here. And they yeah. would have given him, I mean, he could, I mean, he could have done the thing like the comics, you know, the, the cartoons or the, you know, comedy movies where they have the finger in the jacket. You know, stick yeah. Like you there. said before the, the finger in the trench coat. And they would have done it because that was their policy. Right. Yeah. Why, why take the gamble, you know? Now, right. now it's interesting though that um that will never happen again um because of after, after this is a sidebar but after 9 11 you will never see that happen again where they trust a hijacker like pilots will never relinquish the cockpit ever again okay a hijacker's demands will never be met because look they could torture and kill passengers one by one in the back and a pilot will never relinquish the cockpit so after 9 11 the policy of going along with hijackers will never again that changed the game so but before right. then you always went along with the hijackers unless yeah. some crazy fbi agent got a trigger finger and murdered them you yeah. know in front of everybody you know um so but no i i, I believe the bomb it depends on the I, i'll say this it depends on the suspect How about yeah that? Agreed. agreed you know i mean yeah. but i don't think milton Verdal would have killed people but he would have killed himself, perhaps. Yeah, the scenario, the scenario you presented, I think, makes a lot of sense. And then um, I believe you said, I don't know if it was Tina or whichever Stu saw him first, but they said like like 50s. So the age, it really changes older. a lot. And didn't, didn't Bill say that he didn't agree with any of the sketches because he thought no. that they all looked too young? Or, they thought, or something. They, like, Bill, Bill says that the Cary Grant sketch, you know, the final sketch was too young even. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Now, again, Bill's had a long time to think about it, but right. the main takeaway that Bill said was that 
the vibe. He remembers, he doesn't remember the face really, mm. but he remembers the, the energy of the moment essentially. Right. And the right. energy of the moment was that this guy is not a tough guy. He is a dweeb. Yeah. Yeah. And so he said that every time they would bring him pictures for years of skydiving guys, of commandos, he would go, no, this guy was not these guys. Yeah. And so Bill came up to us after our presentation and was like, I really like what you're doing here. Yeah. And he says, I don't, he, Bill said, I don't know if it's this guy, Verdal, you know, or this other guy, you know, but, okay. I, but the energy seems right. It seemed, it seemed like a nerdy engineer guy. He liked the vibe of what we were presenting of this guy who was, this guy who was in, guy who may have been in over his head. For sure. For sure. He wasn't scared of him because they, it's funny. They told they, they, the, the FBI when they were trying to get a description of, of Cooper, they asked Bill and Bill, Bill told us this over breakfast because they asked Bill, they said, Hey, so could you have kicked his ass basically? You know, like if you got in a fight with this guy, could you have whipped his ass? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I could have yanked him out of his chair. Yeah. You know? I'll rip him out of his seat and manhandle him. But, um, but Bill actually mentioned Braden by name, which is funny because Bra- you know, Bill Mitchell has actually become a student of the Cooper case. He mentioned yeah. Braden Rackstraw. He was like, you know, but if it had been like, he goes, but I think about that. Like if I was 20 years old and trying to impress Tina and I'd yeah. like fought this guy and it had turned out to be like a Braden or a Rackstraw, yeah. he'd have killed me on the spot. Yeah, a combat veteran would beat the bag oh, out of me. He'd kill me on the spot. <laughs> For sure. For sure. But, 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 um, but Cooper's timid. We have multiple times where Cooper is trying to avoid any kind of like, you know, the cowboy is causing a scene. Yeah, it gets goes, drunk. And, and Cooper goes, hey, go back to your seat. Go back to your seat. And the guy just ignores him. Yeah. Whereas a military guy, you know, James Coleman told me this on the chat. James Coleman's a former combat combat Marine. James Coleman's like, look, if you're, not, if you're on a mission and somebody's complicating things, a, a, a soldier would have been like, go back to your seat now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, Ted Braden would have took zero crap. Yeah. <laughs> not been like, hey, just please go back to your seat. Yeah, I'd be a please sit down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Timidly. Okay, so I had a I had a Bill Mitchell question for you. I saw you I saw you chase down Bill when you guys completed the panel, and I think you showed him a picture of Milton with a side by side of the sketch. Did you yeah. I, I, this is damn near a useless question because the biggest theme of Coopercom twenty twenty two was how do you remember a face you saw 50 years ago? I can't remember some of her yesterday, but did you get anything out of him? What, what, what did he think of the side-by-side sketches? Uh, he just, he like, thinks he looks response? like him. I mean, yeah. but again, so, he looks like the sketch. I mean, it's, it's hard to parse yeah. his words. Either he's Generally saying, the right look of the sketch. Yeah. He's like, yeah. looks like him. But again, Bill always says, I can't tell. Recall it, which you know, we don't expect him to at this point. No, but. Now Bill has changed his wording a little bit. Like, Bill calls it a turkey gobble. Okay. Now, yeah. to me, a gobble, I, I'm chubby. I have a turkey neck. The gobble is like the skin that's thin and hangs down, right? Mm-hmm. And you get that in older people. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, that's kind of a thing. I mean, you can yeah, be it's like an age. Right. Yeah. I mean, because Cooper was fit. I mean, everyone says that Cooper mm-hmm. was fit. He was not a, he was an athletically looking person, but he still had the thing going on. But that, because that's just age, that's gravity. Right, right. So Bill has said that over time he has started thinking that must have been age because the guy wasn't fat. He mm-hmm. wasn't overweight. Um, the Bill's like, the older I get, the more I think he was an older guy. But no, right. we showed Bill and Bill was like, eh. but I mean, it's hard for Bill to remember, but he just remembers the vibe. And, right. and Bill worked for Boeing for 35 years. Hmm. He, 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 is an, Bill is, he is an engineer. That's interesting. And Bill liked the vibe of him being this nerd because that was just yeah he thought he was an executive kind of like how if you work in retail there's a secret shopper like his thinking yeah. was this was a northwest orient executive yeah doing yeah. some like evaluation yeah yeah, yeah. protocol yeah. or something right uh, undercover boss type thing right <laughs> um uh okay milton verdahl so we got nikki b in the chat we got ryan burns here so i was wondering um did you guys uh did you guys find like his education background as far as okay uh, so he got an undergrad degree in like physical sciences or something uh from washington state at pullman he then he uh he got a grad degree at lehigh university in pittsburgh mm-hmm. okay and then he started working for dupont and uh he that's when the war started and then, then mm-hmm. he went over 
you know, and, and got involved in the Manhattan Project. Yeah. Um, and he actually, it's interesting. So Milton Bordals, we've actually, we have actually not seen his obituary. His obituary, the only one we can find, it's behind a paywall. And we cannot, I mean, I'd pay for it. It's not really behind a paywall. It's not scanned. It, you, we, we can see a little bit of a snippet of it on Google Books. Mm -hmm. Can't see the whole thing because nobody has the whole thing scanned. But it seems like the only thing that is mentioned in his obituary is it was published in his obituary. The only one found is in a is in a it's in a metals metallurgy magazine, and it says he received a commendation from Congress or something um, for he saved the Fat Man bomb. The Fat Man bomb, for those who don't know, was built at Hanford site in, in Washington, and was the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. And apparently, there was something going on um, where there was some kind of problem, and they would have had to have started they would, they would have had to have started over. But he solved this equation that allowed them to keep doing it so mm -hmm. we overuse the words genius all the time um but i do believe I, I think if you have 85 patents your brain works differently than other people i would agree um and i do think he was a genius i mean you can read his writings his brain is like it, he's almost like i mean my first thought was unabomber ish because if you actually if you actually look up the Unabomber's manifesto, his writing style, it, it's proper grammar, it's proper English, but it, it's hard to follow. Yeah, the thought flow is completely yeah. read it. The thought flow is completely disconnected. And that's how Unabomber got caught, right? Is they published his manifesto. The FBI said, if we publish it in papers, maybe somebody will recognize this unique writing style. Yes. Yep. And Verdal's writing style is very unique. It's very mm -hmm. similar to that. And it's funny, there are there uh, Betty Vordile's wife. We we have articles, we have uh, op ed columns written by Betty Vordile. Those are written by DB, I mean, those are written by Milton Vordile. I, I almost certainly believe that Milton Vordile wrote op eds and, and signed them as his wife because he wanted to talk about abortion from a woman's point of view. Right. So, because it's uh, very, Darren is actually the one I sent that to Darren. Darren goes, I don't think Betty Vordal wrote these. This is like Milton. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh shit. And I started like cross-checking uh, his phrases and things from Betty's op-eds to his. It's the same guy. And it's like, come on, man. If if that's pretty weird behavior, that's some strange behavior to actually write as your wife. Like, but no, Milton is a genius. He's a smart guy. Here's the thing about Milton. Here's the thing about, about this is one issue I have with Eric is that Eric is very firm in like saying this only leads to one man, right? And I don't, that's not my thing. I don't, I don't know if D.B. Cooper was Milton Bordal. I'm not saying he was D.B. Cooper. I'm mm -hmm. saying that he warrants further investigation from people. That's I agree. It. I agree. Period. I'm yeah. not saying in any absolutes he was. Yeah, he's older than we think Cooper was, okay? By, by a bit, you know, but again, if you're going to, make exceptions for blue eyes you know light colored hair 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 parted on the wrong side if you're you know missing half a finger if you're gonna make all these exceptions you know what maybe the one outlier was they got his age wrong because yeah. his age varies it goes from 35 years old all the way to in his 50s so it's like it's so weird you know yeah um, i agree we, we have the same problem in zodiac and it's just like i i I kind of detached from age a long time ago. Yeah, it's there. hard to say. And again, if, if you put, listen, men don't wear makeup. And I'm not saying Cooper wore makeup because they, they said that. They said, we don't think he's wearing makeup. But again, yeah. a single layer of foundation can hide a lot of shit. And that might not be obvious to people. I mean, just sure. a single, I mean, and again, big sunglasses cover up your age lines, right? I mean, yeah. you're, you're. Especially you're, back then. I yeah, I mean, your age lines. And again, especially if his hair was, if his hair was dyed black which people, it's almost, we really, his hair looked weird to people. It yeah. looked oh, too yeah. black. Bill yeah, Mitchell yeah. says, yeah. in his 302, Bill Mitchell says, you know, an hour after he gets off the plane, he says, it says, he says, black hair, no gray at all. And to me to even say no gray at all is him indicating that it's almost too black. Mm -hmm. Right? Agreed. In, in, I agree. In a weird way. And so, I agree, yeah. I agree. And so you put black hair on a guy who's 55 years old. I think that's a really hard age to tell men of men. I think 45 to 55, that's yep. a weird, like, again, I, Eric Euless is turning 57 very soon. 
Eric Eulis does not look 57. Yeah. He looks 47. Yeah, he looks 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you, like, and you put big glasses on Eric and take out any gray hair on Eric, mm-hmm. who the hell knows? Yeah, I mean, no, agreed. So in a it, dark look, plane. Look, okay, so Heineman. Heineman was missing for two months. Heineman jumped into Honduras. The, the FBI worked on his description hard. The FBI's official description for Heineman was 40 years old. Heineman turned 50 while he was on the run. Okay. So mm-hmm. Heineman was 10. The FBI said the FBI profile is 10 years younger mm-hmm. than Heineman. And by the way, Heineman was five foot seven or five foot eight in his draft card. And the FBI says he was 5'10. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it, he's, he's taller. Yeah, similar fluctuation. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Agreed. you know, it, it's all over the place. But yeah, I, again, no, I, I'm trying to clear. I'm not saying Milton Ford Dallas, D.B. Cooper, but I'm saying he is a good person to investigate further. That's 100%. it. 100%. I like the suspect a lot. Uh, I'm going to go in on James real quick because he he wants Cooper to have lived, but he wants us to acknowledge the fact that Cooper may have died. Of course, yeah. very possible. But here's my problem with that, James. Some fisherman fell in Lake Merwin the night of the jump, and wasn't he in the water for like, what, eight hours or something? Yeah, and they, they pulled that guy out and saved him. So unless what's gonna Cooper, kill, What's going to kill Cooper is the question. Unless he's totally strangled by his chute and cuts off oxygen before he hits the water, I don't even see any way he could he could die, especially when every one of the copycats landed. His body you know, would have been found. I'm not an expert on anything, uh, any of this stuff, but something would have been found, as Ryan just said, whether that's the attache case, the money, the chute, yeah, the, the skeleton, only, the only something scenario, would have been found. I think the only scenario where Cooper dies the only scenario that makes any sense that maybe is that he went into the drink. Basically he went into the Columbia river that, that he I'm jumped later into the ocean. that he jumped a little bit later than people think. And he mm. landed in the Columbia river with all his shit and got sweat. And look, I, I've been there. I've been to Tina bar. That river is a yeah. fast moving, big river. Same. Yeah. You I know? was, yeah. I wanted to get your impression of that because I went on um, Eric's tour as oh, well. You? And, you know, yeah. I really thought that like, you know, Okay, it's like this river, you're going to hit the water at night, you're going to easily swim across, and no. when you stand on the bank of it, it's massive. No, sir. Way, way wider and you bigger. You land in the middle of it, you're, you know? you're, you're, you're gone, You're done dude. for. You're, you're done dead. for. Yeah, so, and especially I mean, yeah. in a parachute harness with, yeah. um, I mean, look, people, people like, here's the thing. The weight. You picked up, and I know your girlfriend did, I mean, she put it on. Parachutes are, <laughs> yeah, heavy, I too, yeah. parachutes are heavier than people think they are. Oh, yeah. For some reason, if you've never handled a parachute, you don't realize how heavy they are. They're about, I mean, they're 50 pounds. I mean, right. so you have a parachute and a canopy and all the shroud lines and your 45 pound money bag mm-hmm. and, you, and you're asymmetrical into the water. Cooper's probably going to die if he lands in the water. I really think that. So that's the only scenario. And again, for people who think that the money found on Tampa Bar can, yeah. can, can work with that in a way. Yeah. But the only way he dies and the body's not found is to, is going in the water period um, because again you know I, I like the fact that somebody pointed out that uh vultures somebody pointed out the other day um if cooper had died there'd be a lot of vultures circling his body in the woods oh, without a doubt, without and, a doubt. And, that, and and probably some heady fbi agent would have said like hey what's that let's go look at that i, I mean yeah. there are a lot of things that don't end up in the investigative files right but are conversations that probably were had at the time. Hey, let's look around for vultures, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they probably did, but, but let's, I've ahead. actually, I've actually looked at, I've actually searched vulture in the three Oh twos and, I, and mm-hmm. I didn't find anything, but it sounds like maybe they, but just cause it's not three Oh two doesn't mean they, they didn't, you know, look into and, it. And but let's no, reiterate Himmel's box search with his plane, you know, re- relatively soon after. Now they didn't right necessarily after. have boots on the ground, but with the plane searches and, you know, he was the very so, first, he was the very so, first person. To something of, of yeah, if it was vultures, some something of that nature would have been seen. And also the two or three uh, missing women cases that were solved yeah. looking for Cooper's body. So, found bodies. Honestly, yeah. bodies found were bodies. were found. So it's not like nothing was found. Just nothing was found. And again, look, look, here let me go back. This is something about the, about the wiki page that I had to like. Okay, I was able to expunge every single mention of the word wilderness off that page. Mm-hmm. The word wilderness popped up a, a gazillion times on the wiki page. 
And I had to mm-hmm. finally say, guys, this is not proper language. He jumped into a county with 200,000 people, like mm-hmm. less than 10 miles from Portland, Oregon. He's not jumping into the Yukon. Okay. He's not jumping into like, you know, you know, the middle of nowhere, literally. I mean, mm-hmm. th- but, but like people think he did, but he didn't. So that area, I, I, I advise everyone, I say, go Google map, like, you know, La Center, Oregon, you know, or La Center, Washington. It's not the wilderness. It is a suburb of a metropolitan city where he jumped. Right. People right, would right. have found that that area has been logged. That area has been built. Yep. There is a, I mean, where Cooper would, where, where Cooper's body would, would have splatted down. There's a freaking pizza hut there now. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, <laughs> the body would yeah. have been found. For sure. Well, Over as Drew just pointed out, the the, the uh, aft stairs placard later found by the hunters, and then there's the uh, the fiberglass whatever it was that Eric told me about when he was on the show. Yeah, so it's not fiberglass like, now. That's, that's... Yeah, whatever. I mean, I'm just a piece of a plane. So what essentially sure. what I'm saying is, if, if those could be found, I think a body hanging Although, from a tree from a parachute is way more noticeable. So going back to my my analog with McNally. So McNally, mm-hmm. what he did is he threw everything out the back. As I, I believe that Cooper did that. There's no reason to jump with the briefcase. There's no reason to jump with anything else you've got, really. So my belief was that Cooper chunked that stuff out the back before he jumped. Now, again, mm-hmm. if you, did, I posted a video on on uh, the Facebook group of a, a guy who mounted a, a GoPro on his Cessna and flew over mm-hmm. the drop zone area. Okay, the 20 miles before you get to like the suburbs is literally the wilderness. That is the wilderness, right? Mm-hmm. You throw something out there, it's never going to be found. Okay, now so McNally did the same. McNally took off his clothes. He threw his clothes out. He threw he threw his he threw his machine gun. He hit a submachine gun. He threw that out. He threw his mystery bag out. He threw his uh, briefcase with his fake bomb stuff in it. He threw that out. Now the clothes were found. The machine gun was found on an Air Force base, which is funny. Literally, literally an Air Force base. Wow, oh, what that's the hell crazy. Is this? <laughs> so, um, but they, but but his briefcase was never found. So. Yep. And that and, and that's in farm country. He jumped over uh, right. Peru, Indiana, which is like right. about 30 miles north of Indianapolis. So and that was never found. And they were looking for it too. So his 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 attaché case was never found. So DB Cooper's attaché case, um, if he threw it out the back, which I think he did, why, why would he jump with that? What's the point? Literally, yeah. what's the point of that? Why would yeah. you do that? Other than to like keep it from being found like this yeah but, really but, but again why found. it's like again, you know, yeah right i okay, mean so. and it's not going to be found especially if you throw it if you throw it you know yeah. 20 miles out into the wildernesses i mean yeah not saying i have it all worked out no and, and again <laughs> no one cooper, does <laughs> and cooper here's not cooper cooper didn't know about the pressure bump that's the thing so cooper right didn't think they were going to know where, where he jumped out right um, exactly and it was, it was actually kept a secret um from they tried to keep it a secret from getting out to other skyjackers. Mm-hmm. So like we know from the McNally or from McNally's case and from McCoy's case, the FBI during those hijackings got on the horn and said, Hey guys, you're going to feel a pressure bump. We haven't told this. This is not, this is not public information, but when these guys jump off, you're going to feel it. So let us mm-hmm. know. Cause that means he's gone. When, yeah, when, sure. when McCoy jumped, they said, Hey, we felt it. And that's exactly where he jumped over Provo, Utah. McNally jumped. They said, hey, he just jumped. So, like, you know, um, Cooper didn't know that they were going to be able to locate where he jumped. Um, but he, even still, he had a 40 hour head start. I mean, he could have crawled out of where he landed and got away with a 40 hour head start. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, McNally, literally, the sheriff of the county, like I said, caught him an hour after he landed. And, and he talked his way out of it, you know. So right, right, they, right, right. They, they had refined. There's a great story. So, so one of the Cooper copycats, Richard Lapointe. I found this out recently. So Lapointe, they put transponders in his parachute. Right, he jumps out. He lands in a snowfield. He's the only guy that I know of who jumped in daytime. So he actually jumped. His copycatter, his copycat attempt was in daytime. He jumped out in the middle of nowhere in Colorado, lands in the snow, and what and the there was a chase plane that came down tracking his transponder and the chase pay, the chase plane pilot was interviewed. He said, he looked down and the point basically flipped him off. <laughs> he, he, McCoy, he said, he says, uh, the point throws, um, threw his money bag in the air. Like, fuck. 
he says that. That's He's amazing. like, amazing. Yeah. What so it? like, well, don't jump it. Don't jump in the daytime, but or, or check your parachutes for transponders. Although as funny as McCoy yeah. knew that was going to happen, right? right? So he so he remember McCoy opens the parachutes with the transponders and throws them out the back. Yeah, which is pretty clever. Oh um, yeah, definitely. You know, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that, that that's wild. Uh, returning to Milton real quick, uh, and just going back to his work history and the grudge. Yeah. Um, so there's the 71 layoffs in the aerospace industry. So I'm wondering, is is this when Milton is working at, at Vegas or Nevada at this that, time? Okay, so he had a. It's hard for us to tell, but mm -hmm. we know that he was his final patents were working. We're out of Vegas mm -hmm. at a place called Timet or TMCA, Titanium Metals Company, Corporation of America. He works there after the hijacking, too, in the mid 70s, we believe. Basically, it's almost like think of it this way like, you know, in, in college, you have your professor emeritus, like basically, like, you know, guys who just have a job, have a job for life, essentially. And they're just like advisors. Cooper was, I mean, uh, um, Vordal was such a genius for titanium um, that. They they probably you know time it basically seems to have like a relationship with him where they may have paid him a stipend or something to just hang around um, because we know that he always kept a house in Vegas um, and so we, you know but regardless his his lab the only place where he could work on titanium in 1971 was closed down in August of 71 all four mm -hmm. all 450 workers were fired okay so whether he was fired or not, whether he was a salaried employee or whatever, he had no place to work. And um, Milton did not like brain drain. We have several, several op-eds of his, op-eds of his where he's bitching about we're losing, you know, America should never sacrifice scientific achievement. Right. And, you know, he probably really thought that the SST was a scientific advancement. And it was, I mean, look, mm -hmm. America had a, America was, America had a jetliner that could go from LA to LA to LA to New York in two hours. We built it. We were building a fleet of these things. Now, again, because they go so fast, they're on fire. Basically, when you're going above right. Mach, whatever, your, your plane yeah. is on fire. And titanium doesn't melt really. So um, that's why they were titanium planes. So here's this guy who spent 20 years as the as the premier titanium inventor, and here he is in his golden years. He's about to retire. He's already you know, and now. He has this titanium, beautiful titanium fleet. Oh, I've, I've done these great things. And now it's just gone. Get shut down. Yeah. And look, titanium stocks. I mean, Chris Brower found the stocks. It was like, I forget, I forget the numbers, but basically like if, if, if a share of, let's just say if a, if a share of the titanium stock was like 89 bucks after 71, it went down to like, it went down to like $7. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like, if you, if you had invested your, your retirement in that. Yeah. Gone. You're busted. You're busted. And also, Milton had an ego, clearly. Anybody who writes that many op-eds wants to be heard and thinks they're the smartest guy in the room, right? That's a very, it's like Zodiac, right? Zodiac clearly thought he was the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. That was his, that seems like that was his personality. Without well, doubt. Cooper, Cooper, I mean, uh, Verdile had that personality. You write, you write 80 op-eds or whatever, you think you're the smartest guy in the room, clearly. And he probably was, for the most mm -hmm. part. But yeah, again, all of it, all of his, all of his great inventions were assigned, right? It's, it's like the person who invented the, it's, it's like the famous example is the guy who invented the Nike swoop. The guy who invented the Nike swoop was an employee of Nike who assigned that patent to Nike. So if, if he'd actually like been not an employee, I mean, like if that was actually, it, it, if the guy who invented the Nike swoop had gotten royalties off of that, He'd be a billionaire. Oh yeah. But instead, he got his, you know, I mean, you know, whoever that guy was, he got a gold watch whenever he, you know, whenever he retired from Nike. He got nothing for inventing for inventing the Nike Swoop. Well, Milton got That's nothing true. for inventing, you know, alloys that covered seven twenty sevens and the Blackbirds and all these sort of things, right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Um. So you know, I mean, a guy who has an ego may have been like, you know what, and and look. I know, for example, I know, look, I'm this way too. I'm not, a, I'm not an egomaniac, but I, I like doing things, even if I'm the only one 
who knows that I did something, I am happy with it, right? Oh, I'm the same way. You know, it's like I do that. I will spend days on something just for my own amusement to go, I did that. You know, it means mm-hmm. nothing 100%. to anybody else but me. So, I mean, and look, also look, Milton died of a neurological disease. And we looked at this neurological disease. This neurological d- d- disease, the part of the brain it affects is impulsivity. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it, it's, it makes me wonder, was he already experiencing the, the effects of this? That's very interesting. In 71, I mean, 30 years earlier, maybe. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of, look, there was no OSHA back then. There was no, like, workplace safety. Yeah, these mental health working, didn't exist in the 70s. No, these guys are working around, look, uh, uh, Vincent Peterson um, died of Alzheimer's, okay? Um, that may have been influenced by him working around chemicals, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. You know, so, okay, so, hey, Lisa. Lisa's you know all over you guys see, on, just on Milton. I just got the phone <laughs> two hours ago talking with a man who had never put on a parachute in his life and jumped out of a 727 and survived, landed on his feet, okay, and did it. Had never put on a parachute in his freaking life and did it. So She's you can, all over you and Nikki on Milton. That's fine. That's fine. You know what? Knowledge, I mean, yeah, you don't have to have done it. Right. I mean, if you're freaking crazy enough to hijack a freaking airliner, your brain's Boom. not right. Something's wrong with you. I like Nikki's angle right here. Could have been checking for trackers like you just said, a la McCoy. Look, that's the thing. Look, Mark <clears> Meltzer <throat> showed us where the showed us where the packing card was. Right. Yeah. That's a that is exactly where you go. Is there a tracker there? Mm-hmm. I mean, look, Cooper was heady, man. Cooper was clearly thirsty. Five hours, nervous, but he kept rejecting their offers for refreshments because he didn't want to get drugged. Yeah. He, this is a guy who understood variables. And he, right. he, he, would, he, would, he, would, he would have thought they may put a tracker in this damn thing. Let me look for it. I got so, you back. My headphones died. Go on. You know, I, you know, I, I think he would have been heady enough to have done that. Oh, yeah. You know? I agree. I agree. You know, um, and, and again, experience. I mean, knowledge. And again, a guy who is an inventor. Look, the FBI profile says whoever this guy was, he had extreme inventiveness. Mm-hmm. Okay. So to even think about this damn thing. A literal patented inventor. Yeah. Genius. A guy who could think <laughs> of like, let me invent the smartest heist I can do. How about a, how about I jump out of my crime scene as my crime scene is going 300 miles an hour across the country. That's brilliant. Like that, that is so crazy Agreed. smart. So that, here's where my line of questioning was going. Um, t- going back to time it, uh, you guys are saying the plant closes down in 71 for good. It, no, it, it opened back up in 72 okay. probably. Okay. But Are yeah, you, John Cooper was the plant manager who fired yeah, all these people. So yeah, yeah, I wrote that down. If it's um, not look, look, if it's not Milton Vordal, I mean, time that's a good place to look. Okay? Yeah. Now we we sure. can talk about titanium antimony, but the issue with the titanium antimony, and this is where I get with on, on Eric about this. Eric speaks in these Eric speaks in these absolutes. We have no idea if titanium antimony was being screwed with somewhere else. Right. We just don't know. Now it's it's hard to make. It's a very difficult thing. But again, Mr. Titanium Antimony Alloy was working at Time Ed at the time. He may have not got a patent for something. He may have been like giving a, a training lesson to Joe Joe, you know, Joe Johnson. Hey, Joe, this is you melt these things together. Check this out. I learned this back in 55. Yeah, like he yeah. took his samples and went rogue. So you can't say it's only one guy, only Rim Crew. Look, yeah. I like Rem Crew. I like the lead. It led me to Milton Bordile. Thank for sure. God for Eric Euless. But you cannot speak in these absolutes. You just can't because we don't know enough yet. So did you guys verify if Milton returns to work after November 24th, 1971? Okay, so the time at badge that we have, he looks a good bit older than his 1969 passport photo. Okay. So the, the, the photo that everyone has seen of, of Vordal that looks just like comp, Composite B mm-hmm. is his 1969 passport picture. His hair is like slick back, like mine sort of. Mm-hmm. It looks kind of slick back, you know, straight, but it, looks, it almost looks straight slick back. Mm-hmm. But um, Cooper, uh, but like Milton Vordal definitely parted his hair on the left side. 
Okay, every other every other photo we have of him, he's doing this. But his pastor picture is kind of slick back. He looks a lot older in his uh in his name in his uh, time at badge picture, and and it looks like it's from the mid seventies, is my guess. He looks a good bit older. So, yeah, I think that he was working. That is funny too. It's again the vortex, right? Milton's last patent was published the day before. That's bugged out. The day before the hijacking. That's crazy. <laughs> That's so weird. Now again, yeah. it was submitted in 1969. Right. So. But it published the day approval before. process. Yeah, for that sure. That is so That's, creepy. Yeah, doesn't get any more vortex. It, than it, it might mean it probably means nothing at all. But it's still kind of it's almost like Milton Vordal's granddaughter has a YouTube page. Okay, we were we were stalking family members as you do. You just have to do this sometimes. We were stalking family members. No, to Bordal's granddaughter. No, no, no. Bordal's great granddaughter. Bordal's great granddaughter has a Facebook page and has a, has a YouTube channel. Her only YouTube video was uh, "Day Out at Clay Ellum," which is where Rekka claims she jumped. Right? Wow. I mean, it, it means nothing. But yeah. you, you go, oh my god. More vortexisms. More vortexisms. Uh, Clay Ellum, which is where Rekka uh, jumped. I, I like uh, what Nikki was saying here, leaving his tie like uh, he's retiring, like yeah. a symbol. I mean, I, I'm sure he forgot it, but I mean, it, yeah, it was I, it was an oversight. I mean, again, this, this, this is more it. like you know my my area here, this is speculating the conspiracy theory. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything I had written down for Ryan. Uh, I was gonna say I was gonna take you out on my Tina Bar theory. So going yeah, back, going back to the uh, uh, the hitch the hitchhiker theory that we were discussing. Um, Okay, so Cooper lands. He does some sort of hitchhiker thing. You know, this this would be the random accomplice theory. So a person sees him, helped. Hey, I need a ride. Blah blah blah. Yep. Get me out of here. You know, here's six G's. Right? They say, okay, whatever. In the moment, they take the money. They spend two hundred bucks or whatever. But then they hear the news that some crazy guy in a suit skyjacked a seven twenty seven then they get bugged out, so they bury it at Tina Bar. That's my random speculation, but I'm just trying to come up with an explanation for Tina Bar since none of us can do it. We all have our theories. That That's mine. It's the random accomplice theory. You know what I mean? Lisa just made yeah. me laugh. I, I agree, Lisa. I, I do love you, Aunt Lisa. You're great. But um, but no, I, 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 but no I, I do agree um, with you. I actually thought that years ago, years ago, because I was like, I was like, Tina Bar is so weird that it's almost like, it may have had nothing to do with D.B. Cooper himself, right? It may be a, a random thing, like paying somebody else, and they go, oh, shit, you know? Yeah, I don't want to go down like, for this guy just because I gave him a ride. Right. You know, now, whatever. again, you could just say, why didn't the guy burn it? You know, but hell, I mean, not, yeah, not everybody sure. has a five-gallon drum to go burn something in. You know? Or, again, maybe he threw it in the damn river in the spring, and, and it washed up somehow. Well, you know like I mean? Nikki said, you have from what seventy one to seventy nine to for for it to show. Yeah, up we there. don't. So we, I mean, like, Tina Bar is so stupid, convoluted. It, I, it's so complicated. Now, I mean, I don't. I don't think he landed there though. That's I mean, that's where we disagree with Eric. Is that yeah. the Western flight path? If you could make it work, is really enticing because yeah, it goes over Tina Bar basically, essentially. Sure, so that, and that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. But, but again, the 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 radar that was designed to track nuclear missiles as they flew from the Soviet Union to America was tracking Flight 305. Flight 305 was squawking hijacker. They had, they had a squawk. Like, get get the hell out of the way. Get the hell out of the way. All the way to Reno. Make way. Make way. Right? Everyone was watching that plane, right? Everybody was watching Flight 305 because it was the hijacked aircraft, right? We, I mean, it's like, you know, it's almost like on 9-11, they were tracking Flight 93. Flight 93 was, was so much later in the day, right? For sure, yeah. Everyone knew where it was. And then, and then you know, crashed and disappeared, right? But but, but Flight 305 was squawking, hijacker, hijacker, get out the way, get out the way. Everybody get the fuck out of the way. I mean, everyone knew where Flight 305 was. And Cliff Ammerman, as you saw him, you know, Cliff Ammerman was the dude. He was like, I watched it. It didn't yeah. deviate from Vector 23. It just didn't. 
Yeah, I mean, well, let me defend Eric's here on on, on devil devil's advocate because isn't isn't his theory essentially that it followed the Air Force jets as opposed to Flight 305 itself, and then yeah. uh, wasn't Ammerman saying they pinged what they pinged some dish in uh, Western Oregon or again? I have I, I need to get yeah, Dave on maybe next episode because I don't know. I, no, I don't Flight know the Path. On this, I told so. Eric when huh. Eric was when Eric asked me to do panels, I said Eric, I will not do Tina Bar. And I will not do flight path. <laughs> Period. I don't know. Shit. <laughs> I don't know a damn thing. There's too much. There's too much. It's, I mean, I just, I just so repeat what over, I hear. It's so, uh, I so, it's like you know, or drop zone. It's like you know, you know, yeah. Doc Edwards' book. Yeah, yeah. I'm, Doc I'm Edwards has a, has a great narrative, tells a good yeah, story, but then you get into chapters, and it's like ambient. I, I mean, it's natural yeah. ambient, like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just numbers, right? I, mean, I, I do want to read it just to get that side. But again, I'm not going to pretend to know what he's talking about. And, and again, it is a very, it, we need, it would be nice to know where he jumped, but yeah. it's not necessary. It's just not, you know, to, to know exactly where he jumped out is not at all necessary right. for the Cooper story, really, unless you can, because again, even if you say that he jumped near the Columbia River, okay, prove that he went into the Columbia River. You can't. So it, it was right. the point, you know. For sure. For like sure. It's, there's no point to proving. I mean, it doesn't help to know if he jumped if he jumped into the center or if he jumped into Orchards, Washington. So, th that being said, do you get anything out of this Jeff Gray Skyjack story about this? What's the guy's name? Jake or Jack of the extraction team that all all these guys? Oh, like, did, okay. What, what's your opinion on that? <clears throat> that and, would and boy. That would work with ted braden i think yeah i think so too um yeah it, i mean it is weird i mean and no, okay okay so, so okay here's here's your vortex hot take here i think jeff gray good book great book i think he i think he fibs some stuff um mm -hmm. and i have caught him in some fibs mm -hmm. one thing i caught him in is that he he claims there is a section in there where he talks to alice hancock now, Alice Hancock has never, ever, you will never find an interview with Alice Hancock. Not one, not one, yeah. except Jeffrey Gray's book. Jeffrey Gray spoke, did not speak to Alice Hancock. I know he didn't. I know, I know for a fact he did not speak to Alice Hancock because Alice Hancock's name was not Alice Hancock for like another year. I mean, like it, 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 she, she got married. She changed her name. Yeah, I know you found this stuff. Yeah, I found it. So like the fact is, and I, I won't say her name, what her name is now, but like no one, I, I am convinced that no one has ever spoken, spoken, found her because only with the latest like Ancestry.com, things that are recent, things that are recent, that you know, tools that researchers now have, I was able to find her. But 10 years ago, I would not have found out the, right. what her name is now, right. all this sort of stuff, where she lives. So, and here's the weird part. So I believe there is an Alice Hancock imposter. Hmm. Interesting. And, and I'll tell you about this. So, so um, Vicki Wilson, who was Melvin Wilson, it was actually not a bad suspect. Melvin Wilson's um, daughter, who he abandoned, Vicki is a member of our Facebook group. Vicki messaged me and says, hey, I think I have Alice Hancock's contact info. I know, I know you have a crush on Alice, Alice Hancock, and I do. I love Alice, mm -hmm. but I, I think she's like the free, Alice Hancock is. It, she's like the George Harrison of the the group, right? She's the Michael Collins, and Tina and Flo are the are the Buzz and Neil Armstrong, right? I mean, she's mm -hmm. like the forgotten one, and she yeah. was the prettiest one too. Alice is really pretty, so yeah. I, I have a crush on Alice even today. She's a she's a she's a good looking lady even today. I'll say this: she's very pretty. Anyway, still, but anyway, so. Um, Vicky says, Hey, I've got a, I've got a, uh, email for, I have some stuff that Colbert sent me about Alice Hancock. So I get these emails from Vicki Wilson, where she's talking to Colbert 10 years ago. Colbert says, yeah, I talked to Alice Hancock. She's living outside Minneapolis and like, she speaks Japanese. I mean, she speaks, she's learning Japanese. And she said that her dad just died a few years ago. Well, Alice Hancock's dad died in 1967, by the way. Hmm. Um, she's like, and, and so, and so he says this thing about learning Japanese, right? Jeffrey Gray in his book says, I found Alice Hancock on the phone 
living outside Minneapolis, learning Chinese, no, not Japanese, but Chinese. <laughs> and go, Wait a second. Wow. And, then, and then I told Bruce about this at Cooper. I told Bruce Smith about this. And Bruce goes, you think I talked to the wrong Alice? I said, yeah, dude. He goes, well, that explains it. He goes, it was really weird. I called her and she like put the phone down and like started making popcorn and stuff. And I was like, <laughs> Alice? What? Yeah. So this there is, is a woman in Minneapolis. I guess her name is Alice Hancock, who is, I guess she's Asian. Maybe Taking all the calls. Yeah. Who like takes these calls and like just says, okay, stupid white men. Makes, uh, makes some popcorn to get her through the interview. And... Yeah. And like, so Bruce was like, well, that makes sense. Cause it was really awkward and weird. And, and I was like, how is this Alice Hancock? So Jeffrey Gray saying that, saying that she was learning Chinese and then yeah. this random different years later, Colbert saying, it was weird. I talked to this woman and she was like speaking Japanese or something. <laughs> you know? So I don't wow. think Alice Hancock has ever been spoken to. So I have enlisted a member of our Facebook group who is, um, I won't say her, but uh, I've listed a member of our Facebook group who's a female in Texas where Alice lives. And she's going to, um, she's going to make contact with, Al with Alice. I gave her Alice's actual address. And I do think we're going to be the first people to actually contact the real Alice, Alice ever. There is literally no interviews with Alice ever. So, and what's funny is she got married a month before the hijacking. So she was almost known to history as Alice Garley, mm -hmm. uh, not Alice Hancock. So she had just got married to a pilot and that marriage didn't last. Go figure. Um, but she was married to a pilot, but yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, so F James, no, 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 no. Flo is not prettier than Alice. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> wrong man let's keep let's keep it pg guys we're not going to argue who's the better looking stew uh, on flight 305 <laughs> uh the the I, i'm of the bruce smith tribe so i get a little bit conspiratorial i know uh, eric doesn't like wading into those waters but the earl cossey murder conspiracy what's what's uh, ryan burns thoughts on that is it just a random mugging gone wrong or is it some sort of crazy overarching conspiracy of the okay um mugging gone wrong um, I don't think, again, to for the FBI to have murdered Earl Cossey means that they would have given a lot of shits about the Cooper case in 2013. Yeah, they clearly right. gave no shits. It's <laughs> a great point. Very clearly gave no shits, especially not enough to whack somebody. I mean, yeah, no other no other player was whacked by the FBI during the Cooper investigation that we know yeah. of, right? So why? And again, what is Earl Cossey, what information is he going to give them that's going to make any difference to anything? Yeah, because right? he flipped I mean, a ton on his own story. So. That, 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 that's why he waffled. But again, yeah. who cares? It, it makes no difference. I mean, it is interesting. So Cossey, okay, so Cossey, I've tracked Cossey. I actually made a, I'm going to put it on Nordic.org. I nice. have pulled every single Cossey 302. And there's lots of them. I've pulled them and I've put them in chron chronological order. So everybody can see the, the slow descent into bullshit that Kasi takes. Yep. Because he starts out correct. He starts out not fibbing, not embellishing. Yeah. He goes, hey, both these, both these, both of the backpacks were just the same. They were identical back. They were identical backpacks. They were emergency bailout parachutes that like basically what George Bush Sr. jumped out of when he was shot down in the Pacific. They're just bailout parachutes for yep. pilots. And they, when you pull them, they will open. Doesn't matter if you're spinning out of control. That is why Cooper survived, because he had the best parachute he could have had. He had a parachute purposely designed to be opened successfully as you're going, ah, as you're falling from a death spiraling aircraft who is, and if you've never skydived. George yeah. Bush never skydived before. Yeah. He just jumped out of a plane. So yep. anyway. So Cossie says, hey, both these parachutes are identical, right? And then at some point in 74, he goes, well, you know what? Cooper was a dumbass because he had this awesome, like, rig he could have chosen. And then he had this shitty emergency backpack. What a dope. He chose the wrong one. Yeah. What an asshole. And guess what? Not only did he chose the wrong one, he chose one that I made custom. I had the, the ripcord hidden in a yeah. pocket and it's like nah yeah. brah you you pack these parachutes for a pilot 
Norman Hayden bought two parachutes because by law, if you have a two seater plane, um, by law in or in like Washington, Oregon, you had to have two parachutes. Mm-hmm. So he was just flying alone. He had, to, he had to have a parachute in the back seat. So Hayden goes, I want two parachutes. Earl Cossey's gonna make some like, you know, Inspector Gadget parachute That's for the rig. Bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. So Cossey liked to like for some reason. Once Cooper was not caught, he starts to like say Cooper was a dumbass, and I mean, so every so you can see I I will put this up on Norjack at some point soon. You will see his slow descent into like full on Cooper was a dumbass. Yeah. As opposed to, well, he, he the, the parachutes were the same. I mean, you know. And also, he says that Cooper jumped with the older parachute. Not true. On the serial, the, the dates of the parachutes he gave, one was manufactured July of 60. One was manufactured July of 57. Cooper jumped with the July 60 parachute. Hmm. So he did, I mean, he chose the newer one. Maybe he checked the packing cards, you know? And Yeah, for sure. You know, so, but no, Cossie's murder, why? That's the point is, is why murder somebody i mean it's like it would have been right when he started talking as you said why wait 30 yeah exactly and again who cares it's like you know i always say it's like you know if you know hey here's the thing about about 9 11 conspiracy theories this is the funny part about those guys who make loose change you know that that stuff it's it's easy to get it's easy to go that's well building number seven but it's like the fact that the fact that the, the fact the fact that the all-powerful CIA federal government let you live after you put loose change up <laughs> is proof it's bullshit, right? They'd, they'd have killed yeah. you and pulled your video and not let it have 50 million views. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they're that powerful. It's a no, 100. percent Yeah, it's, you know it's, what I'm saying? So it's like, why would they kill Kasi? Yeah, they'd I mean, kill, I mean, not it, that I think like necessarily it was the FBI. I just think it's a, a suspicion. I think he, um, it's my understanding that Cossie may have had gambling issues. Yeah, I think I've heard that mentioned. But then actually. again, the wallet was returned to the family. So Drew just said that. So I was going to put that up next. Well, I like what uh, Nikki said. It took them a year to realize that Kay returned the Cooper money to them. So that's absolutely hilarious. The FBI. <laughs> that's right. H- hilarious. Uh, and then Drew. <laughs> Drew came in with the uh, can't be normal to anonymously mail. Yeah, the that, I've law, never right? heard of that. I mean, I mean, the whole the whole argument is that, you know. OK, OK, time like, out. Time out. I, I'll say this. This is what I'll say. Somebody could have found that if there had been, let's just say there had been cash in the wallet. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I know from criminal defense. I know I have had clients do this. Mm-hmm. They steal shit and throw the wallet out the car. Mm-hmm. You know, they steal the cash. And yeah. they throw the wallet out that way. That, that way, if they're ever stopped, they don't have the damn wallet yeah. with them, that right? Means. So, I think somebody could have found the wallet and said, "Oh, here's the address on this guy's car, on this guy's li- driver's license. I'll send it back to him." Yeah, I mean, I, I so I, I think Bruce investigated those other burglaries in the area, and that, I don't know if they were meth related or whatever, but it was that theory that you know it's the young hooligan son, and he brings it home, and mom finds the wallet and sends it back to the family. I don't, I don't know if I necessarily buy that. It's I would, I'd, I'd prefer just a random citizen finding it. I mean, yeah, it's like, that, I like that's a good angle. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean that that does happen. Let's see what Nikki said. His skydiving buddies think it was somebody that got into a fight with him over Norjack and it got ugly. That would be pretty but why? Nice. But why? Why? Yeah, I don't. Hey, you know, why it's the, vor- it's the vortex. Norjack? I mean, we're yeah. dealing with, you know, James Earl Ray and whatever the hell the guy that killed the NAACP guy that you said. So we're, yeah. we're way out in the deep waters now. Um, Th- this was a bank robbery. It was a very clever bank robbery. That's it. <laughs> Should have yeah, tested the yeah, all, yeah. All this. should have tested the wallet for DNA. Nikki B. Yeah, I hear it. I hear it. And they didn't steal. Oh, not, nothing stolen out of the garage, Drew Beeson. So anyway, I don't know. I just like the, I just finished that chapter in uh, Bruce of just talking about packing the shoots and, and the cost well, stuff. So. Well, wait till you get to the chapter where he remote views talking to Ted Braden. Oh, I can't wait. Life. That's going to be awesome. I'm going to I'm, I'm here for the Bruce research. Ugh. But uh, on, that, on that note. <laughs> Doesn't get any more Cooper Chronicles than that. Gotta love Bruce. But uh, yeah, what we're talking about, guys, is uh, D.B. Cooper and the FBI. Bruce Smith, go get that on Amazon. And I'm fortunate enough to get my copy signed by the legend at uh, at CooperCon 2020. Oh, by the way, Drew, don't forget, uh, uh, Ted Braden from The Afterlife told Bruce Smith (laughs) 
that he was not Cooper. He said, he, 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 said, he said it was a guy named Charles Barkley. Drew. Charles Barkley? Yes. <laughs> Drew. Ted Braden, Ted Braden told Bruce Smith from heaven that, Drew. Uh, that a guy named Charles Barkley killed. We're, a, we're a, sank. A, we're sank. The remote viewing sank us, Drew. The, 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 take your book <laughs> off the shelves, man. <laughs> No, but I love Braden regardless. Uh, on that note, I think we've covered everything. Unless uh, Ryan has anything new, go check out the uh, the Rem Crew uh, suspect panel on Finding D.B. Cooper. That's Nikki B's channel, norjack.org. Do you have anything else for us, Mr. Burns? No, man. This has been Ryan fun. Ryan Burns, Esquire. He crushed it, man. This is, uh, this is volume five. Hopefully get uh, Dave on. Hopefully shoot for Marty Andrade down the line. Shout out to everybody who came through, Nikki B, Lisa, James. Uh, hopefully we didn't lose too many people when we had that uh, when we had that uh, audio technical issue. Apparently my wireless headphones had a microphone on it, so we all learned that together, so that was fun. Uh, but, yeah, definitely shout out to Ryan. Oh, join us in the D.B. Cooper Mystery Group on Facebook. These guys put – you guys move so fast in the Vortex, man. I try to keep up, and the way you guys crowdsource, like – your information is amazing. I wish Zodiac moved 1% that fast because that's right. Everyone says what's going to happen when the vortex is over and we find Cooper and identify him. Dude, I'm going to recruit all you guys into Zodiac and get all those little research <laughs> stuff that you have. We're just going to go right on to the next one. <laughs> I'm, I'm game. I'm game. Ryan Burns, people. Uh, yeah. Uh, where to find you and your research? Mostly Norjack, right? Norjack.org. Sure. Norjack.org. Thank you for coming su su through, sir. I appreciate you. Your time. All right, Ross. Take care, man. Good night. Awesome show. Have a good one, Ryan. All right, guys. That's that. I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed the show. We went like two hours. We went, I went big for you guys because uh, we had a little had a little tech issues. Uh, probably shooting for Dave on next. And uh, we're just going to keep it cruising. Anybody wants to come on, get at me. There's a bunch of new episodes on the Vortex. Go check out Nikki B and Ryan on the D.B. Cooper Vortex with Darren Schaefer. Uh, of course, stay tuned to the uh, D.B. Cooper Mystery Group lives. There's a bunch of good ones with Eric, Ryan, Nikki, uh, Chris. You know what I mean? And shout out to those guys. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that uh, that panel that these guys had. I was you, you can literally hear my response when I was filming for them at CooperCon 2022, when they unveiled the picture of uh, Milton Verdal and Vincent Peterson. And I was just like, that's crazy. Like, I, I couldn't believe it. I was blown away by that panel. I, I pretty much went just to get that. But uh, definitely like and sub, like and sub to Finding D.B. Cooper. That is, uh, that's Nikki B. And hope you guys all enjoyed. Uh, get at me. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm on Twitter. Subscribe to the channel, Zodiac Files, episode four is coming soon. The Gavita Beach murders. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate you guys. Yeah. Oh, oh, and don't forget, there's a bunch of uh, panels on my channel as well. Eric and Mark, uh, Bruce and Nikki, the conspiracy panel. That was awesome. And yeah, there's quite a few on mine as well as a little drop I did shot directly at Tina Bar on location. Don't try to go there. Private property. We are out. Thank you guys for coming through. Appreciate everybody. Appreciate the support. Like, sub, sub and share. Thank you. Appreciate the discussion in the chat too. You guys are wild. <laughs>